Um, I'm one of the co-chairs of the uh, Antrim and Down branch, and we're holding today's conference with Prony. I just want to say thanks to Ian for all the hard work. I'm just up here in the limelight. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. We've got Richard Grayson's flyer for his new book, um, so please do get that. You can also listen to it on the WFA podcast, which he's um, actually agreed to do one this morning, which is very kind of him, which unfortunately I chair and present, so I'm um, <laughs> blowing my own trumpet, so to speak. Um, beyond that, we are, we are also recording today's talks, and we're going to hopefully put them out um, on the branch podcast, which has been a bit dormant for a while. But um, before anything else, I'll introduce our first speaker, which is Dr. <coughs> Timothy Bowen, who is Senior Lecturer at the University of Kent. He's going to talk about recruitment in Ireland in 1918. Tim. Well, thanks for that, Tom. Um, I'm very kind of the Western Front Association um, probably to ask me over to uh, speak to you today. Um, I was thinking about what to say um, today, and it struck me that I've been standing up here on a fairly regular basis since 2013. It all started with some of you in the audience who are now looking like, you know, hardened <coughs> veterans, almost old contemptibles, if we can use that phrase, uh, who have been through uh, five, five years, four years at least. Uh, of the uh, commemorative period, and of course Prony's undoubtedly going to be doing more to do with the Irish Revolution, which could bring us all the way on to uh, 2025 with the Boundary Commission, so within that sort of context of the Great War and uh, the Irish Revolution, you may see me again. Um, I was also conscious when I was looking up the notes and all this that I'd spoken about this time last year about conscription and recruitment in Ireland. Uh, in 1918 and was worried that some of my audience might actually remember that talk but my mother reassured me saying that probably uh, nobody had remembered it at all so I could just push on and say much the same thing. Uh, so it's nice to see the support that one can always rely on from one's family uh, in these contexts. Um, what I'm planning to do is say a bit about uh, the conscription crisis which does set up a fair bit of where we are. I then try and turn to um, my slides here which uh, this is the challenge, give me a minute, um, where I'll talk about some of the recruiting literature. But I thought there were a few contexts that I should talk about first. This takes us back quite a while. Um, I suppose you can think about various myths to do with Ireland and Britain and the First World War, and there's sort of two of them that are, are worth thinking about before we go much further looking at recruitment in 1918. The first one is the idea that in Ireland, after the Easter Rising, recruitment is dead. That after that, you know, there's complete alienation between Ireland and Britain, and recruitment is, is dead in the water. You'll see from that, those figures there, that actually recruitment in Ireland isn't looking too chipper before the Easter Rising. Um, the big uplift and the appropriateness of speaking today is perhaps lost in most of us, but it did strike me when I was putting this together that we're in the 104th anniversary of the massive recruitment meetings that were held in Belfast that formed the Ulster Division and recruitment in Belfast uh, was very good. There's actually one day, I think it's the 19th of September, where there are more recruits come forward in Belfast than come forward in any other city in the UK, including London. That's quite a record when you think of the population uh, disparities. <coughs> so that explains a lot about those first figures that go all the way up to um, 50,000, that sort of original fill-up. We're seeing in <coughs> pardon me, September and October 14 organised UVF recruitment. Then smaller scale but still significant, you're getting Irish national volunteer recruitment from November through to uh, from November 14 through to February 15. So that's why we get such a big uh, uplift there. Having said all that, the recruitment base in Ireland is always seen as somewhat disappointing in a British context. Uh, the figures in Ireland as a whole look poor even compared to agricultural districts in Great Britain. So if we're thinking about the wider context of this, Irish uh, recruitment is always seen as a bit problematic from the, the point of view of, of British policy makers. Still, if we're looking at overall figures, about 200 Irishmen enlisting during the First World War, and as Richard Grayson says in his new book, uh, well worth a read, um, 35, 40,000 enlisting from Dublin. So we shouldn't get carried away with the idea that all these figures are sort of convinced Ulster Unionists and Ulster Protestants that are making up uh, the figures. You'll then see that as we get to the last stage of the war, understandably, you know, recruitment goes down quite a bit as you're through 1916-17. But there is then the fill-up 
from February uh, to November 1918. And that really is in the context of a proper recruitment campaign. Um, that Trump sounds odd to say, but earlier on in the war, the recruitment campaigns in Ireland were pretty poorly organised, ad hoc, localised, and it's only as we get into 1918 that you see a properly uh, organised campaign centrally directed. So that, that does a lot. You know, the power of advertising is something to, to think about within this context. Um, there is indeed that little figure that's thrown up now and again, which is that Round Tree's chocolate paid more for its advertising in 1913-14 than the British Army paid for its advertising. So if you're thinking about advertisement, uh, you know, the commercial sector is quite well developed. In the Edwardian period, the Army is, is not at all well developed and, and struggles to catch up with that. So that's sort of one myth then to think about is where sort of Irish recruitment sits in the grand scheme of things and, and where it falls off compared to the Easter Rising. The other one to think about is that idea that what sort of war is the First World War? Well, it, it's very clear in an attritional war uh, that creates a need for constant recruits. But there is the real moment of crisis that comes for the British, um, French, Belgian, American armies in March, uh, April 1918, when you get the massive German Spring Offensive. And that then is the context for there suddenly to be a, a massive manpower crisis and a need to get more manpower in. Now the first part of that policy which in, in, impacts on recruitment in 1918 and Ireland as a whole is to extend conscription. Conscription had been brought in in GB in January 1916 after a voluntary system and then the so-called Derby scheme which was sort of a halfway house between uh, volunteering and conscription where men would put their names forward with the understanding that they would be called up when they were needed. So it's a, a sort of strange halfway house by the government. But conscription full on comes in January uh, 1916 but not extended to Ireland um, at that point. In the crisis of March, April 1918, the view is that conscription needs to be extended to Ireland. Now, that wasn't, it seems, out of any great hopes that Ireland was going to produce massive amounts of recruits. There are some incredibly optimistic figures put forward by some in government that Ireland may produce 150,000 uh, conscripts. Uh, that's highly optimistic. Most historians, particularly Adrian Gregory looking at this, have suggested that really what's going on here is that David Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, thought he couldn't sell extended conscription in Britain, where the age was going to go up to 55, uh, if Ireland was still left exempt, that this would create enormous ill feeling in Great Britain, and that uh, the Irish political concerns, not for the first time in British politics, we might reflect, had been pushed to the side in terms of a, a greater uh, project. So the conscription uh, attempt for Ireland is is not uh, accepted uh, by nationalists in, in any shape or form from really very early on. Attempts are made to rush through the legislation in the April uh, 1918. The crisis hits effectively 21st of March. That shows you just how much of a crisis it is that the legislation has been drafted uh, and been drafted and is entering the House of Commons on the 9th and 10th of April. Now at that point John Dillon, who's then the Irish Parliamentary Party leader, remember that John Redmond is dead by this stage, so Dillon's his uh, successor, and he said that the effect of extending conscription to Ireland at that time would be to, to destroy all hope of an Irish settlement during the war. He also went on to say that this would open up a second war front in Ireland. A front which would be all the more formidable because it would be a moral contest that this would be opposed uh, by the Irish people, uh, not on arms, but it would be opposed. And Dillon then makes it clear that the Irish Parliamentary Party is not uh, supportive of this policy at all. Uh, that then is extended. The Lord Mayor of Dublin, Lord O'Neill, organises a conference at the Mansion House in Dublin on the 18th of April, which brings together. The Irish political party, so Irish parliamentary party, Sinn Féin, Labour movement, Roman Catholic bishops, uh, and so on, and they all come out and oppose conscription at that stage. So you start to see um, Sinn Féin sort of moving into being the leading political party because abstentionism from Parliament is pushing the IPP to decide to go along with that. And there is this idea of mass opposition and public uh, opposition to conscription. You then get uh, an anti conscription pledge which is taken at the church door of practically every Roman Catholic uh, parish church 
on the Sunday the 21st of April and interestingly what's done in that pledge is something that looks a bit like um, the Covenant so if you think about the Ulster Covenant in 1912, it's that idea of a mass public demonstration, mass public signatures against conscription. So that happens the 21st of April. Then on the 23rd of April, there's a one-day general strike in Ireland, which is effective uh, throughout most of the island, the exception being sort of unionist parts of Ulster, um, sort of Greater Belfast itself. Even there, um, you know, West Belfast is pretty much on, on strike action. So faced with all that, the British government decides that they really can't force through conscription. Um, the Chief Secretary for Ireland starts to talk about the idea of the, the British government might as well conscript Germans uh, because if these guys are forced into the ranks they're not going to, to do anything anyway and the number of British troops that would be needed to corral Irish conscripts into the British army would be more than the numbers that would ever be uh, raised for service on the, the Western Front. So that's where the sort of conscription dynamics uh, fit into it. Um, if you think about the Unionist response to all this, this becomes more problematic. The British government decides that they can't bring in conscription, so they decide to go for a volunteer system and to then push that more firmly. Not that's what we'll get on to in, in a moment. But for Unionists, that's very problematic because Unionists had publicly supported uh, conscription so that seems to put them into quite a dilemma and you get a uh, flavour of that from a number of the, the papers that are held here in Prony. There is a, a major landowner out in uh, County Tyrone, Fulmerburg Montgomery, who is a, a big name in the Ulster Unionist Council and he has a lot of correspondence with uh, leading unionists. And you see particularly correspondence with him and Richard uh, Dawson Bates, where he's saying that they're really in a bit of a bind that if they don't support this volunteer movement uh, to get recruits from the British Army, they're going to look unpatriotic. But this negates the fact that they supported conscription and thought that Ireland should be treated the same way as the rest of the UK. So unionists are put in quite a bind there. Um, there's also a problem within unionism, of course, which the leadership recognises, which is that a number of uh, the sort of grassroots of unionism are not terribly keen to join the British Army. Uh, you know, this is, is one of the key things, you know, that those enthusiasts who wanted to join the British Army had. There's now quite a lot of unionists who are involved in things like the shipbuilding industry, munitions, who are being very well paid and don't really want to sacrifice that. That's one fear that comes up. The more public fear that's put forward is that if these men are conscripted, then who comes to take all those jobs and munitions and shipbuilding and the idea that this will be the men from the south that will benefit, that they will get the jobs that will pay most money as uh, men from Belfast are packed off uh, into the army. So unionism has quite a difficult uh, line to follow with all this. You also see something quite interesting in, in unionism at this point, I think, because earlier in the recruiting campaign, certainly back in 1914-15, it was then that the Ulster Volunteer Force had subsumed everything else. So you got a few statements from the Orange Order, but basically supporting the UVF recruiting drive. You had very little from the Protestant churches in 1914. You had the uh, local councils basically you know, gave over their powers to, to the UVF. So the UVF subsumes all else in a sort of pan-unionist uh, grouping driving recruitment. But as you get to 1918, when the UVF is basically a spent force, uh, you get other bodies that come forward, and, and some of these you know, are, are quite uh, interesting. One of our, our later speakers is going to be talking about the uh, Presbyterian Church uh, and recruitment, and the Presbyterian Church comes out in favour of conscription at uh, uh, a General Assembly meeting, which, which seems incredible for a church that's meant to be about dividing religion from the state. Uh, so that's one approach. The other one that's more um, surprising and perhaps looks even odder when you read about the newspapers is that the loyal orders all come out in favour of conscription. And you know, let's face it, there's nothing like watching tens of thousands of marching men to realise that there's lots there that could be conscripted. Uh, but that's an already that doesn't seem to be uh, uh, realised on a number of Orange and Prentice Boys platforms. So you have these uh, mass parades which hadn't taken place earlier in the war where they, they pass resolutions in favour of conscription. So some very odd things go on there. 
Uh, you get certain unionist councils, Bangor and Lurgan, uh, urban district councils, the, the paperwork of Bangor uh, council is here at Prone, they back uh, conscription. And a lot of what's being said publicly is this idea of shared citizenship, the idea that if men in uh, Ireland are British citizens, then they have to do their, their fair share as British citizens. So that's something that's pushed a lot. But behind the scenes is the idea by a lot of these uh, councils and wider unionist groups that really unionist Ulster has probably given enough that a lot of the men that are working in agriculture will be exempt from conscription, certainly those that are in shipbuilding munitions will be exempt, and that the burden of this won't really fall too much in the unionist population. So there's a certain uh, duplicity in the, the unionist approach there. <coughs> Edward Carson and James Craig support the recruitment campaigns through 1918, but in writing rather than on platforms. So if you're going back to the recruitment of the Ulster Division 1914-15, there are Carson and Craig talking to mass public meetings, um, talking quite candidly, it has to be said back then about the problems of, of home rule. Um, but when you get to this period, there is that obvious contradiction that they support the idea of conscription but the British government thinks that they should be um, supporting this new recruitment campaign. Uh, so they do support it, but not with, with massive enthusiasm, uh, it has to be said. You can look at other aspects of this. It may be that Craig and Carson were rather scarred by the experience of the Ulster Division in the Somme, that having encouraged so many, many men to enlist, and then seeing such high casualty lists that that had uh, created uh, deep uh, problems, even trauma perhaps, for them. Uh, there's also the fact that Craig and Carson are both in the coalition governments who are much more London based by 1918 than they have been in 1914-15 so there is an issue about whether they're simply seeing things through a wider uh, London perspective and don't really have the sort of feel for grassroots unionism uh, that would be the case elsewhere. Um, in terms of the nationalist response, uh, really after the whole conscription crisis, the IPP withdraws from recruiting activity. It, it, it's really as simple as that. The only major um, IPP figure that you see on platforms uh, after April 1918 is Stephen Gwynne, who was the nationalist MP for Galway City, but he um, had become an independent MP at this stage, so he's not representing the views of the Irish Parliamentary Party. Uh, so that's worth bearing in mind uh, there. Uh, Joe Devlin, the MP for West Belfast, uh, I think you can argue recasts Northern Nationalism and the Northern I IPP in a much more middle mode after uh, the conscription crisis breaks. Uh, it says a lot that in November 1914 he's appearing in St Mary's Hall in Belfast in front of a, a flag which is a blue background with a, a golden harp on it and encouraging men to enlist in the 16th Irish Division. In April 1918, he's standing in the same venue in front of a tricolour telling men that they, they must not be conscripted and there's no, no support for a, a recruitment campaign uh, beyond that. What the British government ends up doing then is really clutching its straws. Um, I'll just try and move this to some other slides, uh, if you bear with me for a minute. They turn to a very um, off-beam character, um, Arthur Lynch, who had been uh, he's, he's described as a colonel. He had commanded a Boer commando unit in the South African War. And the British government turns to him to raise uh, an Irish brigade, as the term goes. So the attempt to do accommodation with, with nationalism looks to be really weird. Having uh, really alienated moderate nationalism in the shape of the IPP, they then turn to what appears to be a more militant uh, mode of nationalism. Now, Arthur Lynch's campaign doesn't really seem to work too well. And I think that poster gives you an idea why. Um, you know, it's uh, pretty dull stuff. And... Uh, you know, I appeal for help to raise a brigade to fight the Western Front. We then get all sorts of things about how, well, you can't really rely on the Americans to, to give Ireland independence after the war, and you, what, what later becomes the Versailles Conference, but they're talking about the Peace Conference, you, know, you can't rely on that. So the only way, really, as a nationalist, to ensure uh, that Ireland's independent after the war is to do your bit for the British Empire. So it's a very, very old recruiting line that he follows, which, which predictably um, doesn't seem to appeal much. The reports of his meetings, which are held fairly widely throughout Ireland, um, in Ulster and in Uri, 
uh, is, is the local one uh, here that I've come across. Um, it seems that he um, has these recruiting meetings, which then are effectively hijacked by Sinn Féin. Because at this stage of the war, the British government had used the Defence of the Realm Act to prevent lots of public meetings, including party political meetings. So basically, Sinn Féin local organisers realise all they have to do is turn up at these meetings, shout down Lynch, and they've got a meeting that the police won't break up uh, with any luck. So that's, that's what goes on there. Um, so the, the Lynch campaign seems to be uh, something of a, of a, a dead letter. Um, but there is a campaign that, that's pushed forward, which does seem to, to yield some results. And this is to do with the formation of the Irish Recruiting Council. Still a largely um, unionist body, uh, as we would expect, and often turning to major unionist landowners uh, for platform speakers, which, which don't always work um, terribly well. Um, John Leslie from Monaghan, who commands one of the reserve battalions of the Ulster Division, is quoted at one of these recruitment uh, talks as trying to appeal to agricultural workers and farmers and farmers' sons by saying, you know, I don't care about the damned pratties, we need the men. So in other words, it doesn't really matter if your farm goes bankrupt, I need to join the army, which you know, isn't really a, a, a great rallying, rallying call. Um, some others seem to be pretty inept um, platform speakers. Um, W.A. Montgomery, who I'm sure has no relationship to, to Indian, um, seems to get very exercised about Jewish cockneys in the Ulster division and sort of goes on about these endless rants about how uh, Ulster had promised that it would support its division and that instead they were getting flooded with all these cockney Jews and that this wasn't what was expected. And there's a very ugly sort of eugenics element uh, to some of his speeches. So some of these things clearly uh, work very badly and a number of these platform speakers are, are really um, remarkably poor. But the sort of poster campaigns and so on that go on are quite sophisticated and do appeal in a number of uh, ways that haven't really been tried uh, before. So um, I'll put that one up which is not perhaps the most uh, clear photograph but might give you some idea of it. The problem after the recruiting, um, sorry, after the conscription crisis, is that recruiting is still driven by the idea of conscription. So what you end up with is each of the regimental areas in Ireland. So you can think uh, Belfast, Antrim Down, our Royal Irish Rifles recruiting area. They're all set these quotas, and what is being said at recruiting meetings is that if these quotas aren't met then conscription will be brought in. So conscription still hangs over as a cloud uh, of the whole lot. Um, I don't think any of these areas actually make uh, the, the quotas that are set, but this is the idea of these hands, that they're, they're meant to be a set target, and the idea is these areas are recruiting towards those targets. So that's uh, what they're focused on. Whereas earlier on in the war, um, there haven't really been targets set. You know, one of the key things you see when conscription comes in in Britain is the idea that the Army, Navy, later Air Force need a certain number of men a month and that then feeds into uh, the attempts to get men. In Ireland that's never really the case. It's just sort of you know, men and more men as the original Kitchener cry went. So this then is trying to set some sort of, of uh, element, uh, uh, some metric to what recruitment should look like. Um, which again means that some of the platform speeches are not terribly scintillating, that they tend to be saying, you know, the men of this area have to raise X thousand men, and if you don't come forward, you're going to be conscripted. Uh, the thread that's then used, linked in with that, is that if men are conscripted, they can be sent to any part of the armed forces, whereas if they enlist voluntarily, they can go to the branch of their choice. Now, that might not sound that important, but what you start to get in the local press this is for Oma, is uh, lists of men who have enlisted and what they've gone into. I'm not lined up so I can't move. Um, these are all RAF. These are all RAF. <coughs> uh, so what's being sold there is a mass recruitment campaign in Ireland for men to join the Royal Air Force on the idea that you're likely to be employed as ground crew, so you're unlikely to be up near the front line and you're probably going to be trained as a mechanic. So once you leave the Air Force, you're going to have a useful skill for Subby Street. About half of the men that enlist in 1918 then, and we're looking at, you know, as you saw in the earlier figure, about 15,000, about half of those go into the RAF. So that gives you an idea. That hadn't been pushed. You know, RAF's only an independent service from April uh, 1918. 
uh, so it hadn't been pushed as a separate service before that. So that's one way in which uh, the figures start to come together. There are problems, of course, with RAF recruitment. Um, you'll see uh, these sort of recruiting posters appear here. Great Lurgan recruiting rally August uh, 1918 in Church Place. Come and see the aeroplane exhibition of flying. Guess what happened on the 31st of August 1918? It was too cloudy, the planes couldn't fly. So Ulster being Ulster, a number of these attempts to uh, entice men in the Air Force don't work. So that sort of idea of a new sort of technical arm uh, don't really work out uh, at all. So that's one way of trying to reconcile all this is to encourage men to enlist in the RAF and then to push the idea that that's sort of non-combatant. Uh, um, there are a few other um, approaches taken. Um, That's an older one that pushes, so you've got Ireland and the army, where it pushes the idea of your local infantry regiment. So there are still these appeals to sort of history and heritage, and you do get um, some of these sort of potted histories of regiments that encourage men to join those. So that's uh, another obvious one. Um, tanks and cavalry, uh, again, the tank seen as a very modern uh, method of warfare, more technically advanced than being an ordinary infantryman. Cavalry perhaps being seen as a little bit behind the lines and unlikely to get shot at uh, too badly in trench warfare. So you can see certain pushes for that. Um, the other one that I don't think I have... Um, Sorry, I thought I had one about uh, the naval recruitment. Uh, the Navy pushes this idea of men joining um, the trawler service, which is to deal with mines. So the idea is that if you've got fishermen, they're used to trawlers anyway, so it's the idea of men doing their, their civilian job, but under Royal really Naval colours, um, being comparatively well paid for it. And the idea of dealing with mines is not being terribly difficult that you know, they wouldn't be under enemy fire, these things could be sort of uh, diffused in, in situ without too much trouble. It's, it's a bit of a harder sell than some of the RAF stuff, but you can see where that one uh, goes. The other line that you've got later on is, as you get into August um, 18, is the idea that men can carry out their civilian jobs in the army. So you get a push that if men are clerks, they can continue being clerks in the army. Uh, and this sort of fulfills a long running view of British recruitment in Ireland. The view was that the groups that really hadn't responded were white collar workers, so clerks and shop assistants are the ones particularly uh, targeted in that, and also um, farmers and farmers' sons hadn't responded, so a lot of the attempts in recruitment are to target those groups. But the truth of the matter is that most of those who enlist in the um, British Army in Ireland in the First World War, even back in those heady days of September 1914, were generally um, unskilled labourers, factory workers, groups of that sort. In many ways the same sort of social strata that enlisted in the British Army in peacetime. So whereas in Britain you're used to this idea of the PALS organisations and the territorials encouraging enormous numbers of skilled working class and who are middle class men to come forward. That doesn't really happen much in, in Ireland and the British government never really manages uh, to resolve that problem. So the recruiting campaign that you get from certainly from July when it comes into full swing in 1918 up to the end of the war is much better organised than anything that had gone before. The figures suggest that you know, there were recruits there that if they were properly targeted would come forward, but the numbers are still falling very far short of what the British government had hoped would come forward in Ireland. Uh, so this certainly isn't a panacea. Perhaps the surprise from the point of view of what you know, is happening in Ireland at the time and what's about to happen in Ireland in 1919-20 is that you know, men were coming forward in large numbers at all. But the extra you know, sort of shock element to that is that more men enlist in the British Army from Ireland in 1919-1920 than enlisted in 1918. So the sort of recruitment rates uh, don't have a very obvious relationship to the politics and the, the revolution as it, it breaks out in Ireland in 1919-1920. Right, I've spoken for about half an hour there, so I think I should end at that point and hand over to your next speaker. I'll be very happy to take questions at the end. Is that how we do? Yes, yeah. great. Thanks very much.
Uh, I'm very grateful for the invitation again to, to talk to you about Presbyterians and conscription. I'm very glad that Tim has talked so comprehensively about conscription because it saves me having to uh, go over that ground. Because I'd like to focus now on the Presbyterians. I'm afraid some of the things I'll be talking about are a bit theological, but uh, I try to focus as much as possible on the question of recruitment and conscription. The motto at the top of the Belfast Cenotaph at the City Hall reads, Deo et Patria, for God and country. Many of the soldiers commemorated there were convinced that they were fighting a righteous cause, God's cause, and that he was on their side. The First World War wasn't a religious war, of course, not a war about religion, but it was a war in which many combatants were strongly motivated by religion. And for many of its supporters, it was a holy war. Many recent American historians have reached the same conclusion concerning the American Civil War. And it's useful to remember that although the technical advances of the Great War, like machine guns and tanks and aircraft and poison gas and so on, made the two wars very different, those who fought them were closer in time and outlook than we are to those who fought in World War II. I'd like to start by reading to you an extract of a letter from Private Jim Donaghy, a teenager with the Derries, the 10th Battalion of the Inniskilling Fusiliers in the 36th Ulster Division. He describes the mood of some of his comrades at the Somme as they prepare to go over the top on the 1st of July 1916. The noise was terrible. No one was talking. You couldn't even hear yourself speak. Men had their wee Bibles out and were reading them. Others had taken photographs of their mothers, wives and children out of their tunic pockets and were looking at them. Some were making their wills in the back page of their paybooks. Just before the first units went out into no man's land, my platoon was one of them, we all said the Lord's Prayer, and then we said it again. We sang hymns, even though we could hardly hear our own voices. A modern filmmaker would not depict a pre-battle scene of the First World War as Jim Donaghy did. And I admit that they may not be wholly representative of the men there that day. He was a member of the Reformed Presbyterian Congregation of Fawn near Drumahoe. Many of his colleagues could have resented this demonstration of piety and even seen it as unmanly, but it's difficult to doubt that it happened. I'd like to give just one more example of an Ulster soldier's religious faith. This is Oliver Brown writing about the death in action of his brother, Lawrence Crawford Brown, on the 16th of August 1917. He was the best of brothers. His life was an example to me of Christianity put into practice. And I pray God that he may give me grace to reflect the love of Christ in my own life, as Lawrence did in his. His religion, though not often on his lips, was always in his heart and visible in his face. His death, too, is an inspiration, for he fell both as a soldier of King Jesus and a soldier of the earthly king. And I pray God that when I cross the river, be it early or late, I may face death with the same high courage and simple faith. The Brown boys were grandsons of the prominent Presbyterian layman, Sir William Crawford, who was to play a leading role in the formulation of the Presbyterian view of conscription. But before focusing on conscription, I'd like to place Irish Presbyterianism within the bounds of the sort of civil religion which prevailed in most of Europe and America in the early 20th century. Civil religion as a concept can be traced back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 18th century, but it was especially formulated and explored by a number of American sociologists in the 1960s and 1970s. Sometimes it's termed civic religion, or public religion, or even popular religion, or popular religiosity. But the term civil religion seems to be the one that has endured. I think the following online definition is a good one. Civil religion means the implicit religious values of a nation as expressed through public rituals, symbols, such as the national flag, and ceremonies on sacred days and at sacred places, such as monuments, battlefields, or national cemeteries. It stands outside the churches, although church officials and ceremonies are sometimes incorporated into the practice of civil religion. Now, sometimes the implicit doctrines of civil religion are at variance with the official doctrines of individual churches, which can cause a problem. But I would contend that in the First World War, the Presbyterian Church in Ireland conformed to the prevailing civil religion, or at the very least, they condoned it. 
This civil religion was essentially a fusion of the Christian faith, patriotism, and militarism, and was to some extent a product of the age of imperialism. In the case of Britain, it can be traced right back to the 1850s, to the Crimean War and the Indian Mutiny. It helps to explain the immediate and enthusiastic support which Irish Presbyterianism gave to the war effort in August 1914, and indeed throughout the war. Such a combination of religious devotion, patriotism and militarism was not of course confined to Irish Presbyterianism, it was to be found in all of the combatant countries of the First World War. From August 1914, the Presbyterian Church in Ireland saw Britain's engagement in the war as a righteous cause and strongly encouraged its young men to volunteer for service. Not just as their civic duty, their patriotic duty, but their religious duty. This encouragement took many forms, especially the sermon. I'd like to quote from just one, which I think is fairly typical. It was preached by the Reverend James Hare. Uh, in my own church, my own, my own Presbyterian congregation, on the 27th of September 1914. It was there to mark the second anniversary of Ulster Day and the signing of the Ulster Covenant. In the congregation were members of the Malone and Balmoral contingents of the South Belfast Regiment of the UVF who had paraded up the Lisburn Road. I think they probably didn't have their rifles with them on that day. Here are a couple of extracts from the Reverend Hare's Her sermon, as it was reported in the Northern Week. Their own country, Great Britain, with its small population, was made the instrument to crush out the greatest tyranny of Europe in its day. And they always believed that victory had been due to the almighty arm of God. So they could count on that in the coming conflict. Let them not forget that if God was with them, no man could be against them. And he asked, had anyone seen anything more glorious than the spontaneous rising up of England's sons to give their lifeblood rather than submit to German tyranny? It was one of the noblest of deaths that men should die for the glory, honour and freedom of their country. Not yet explicit in the Reverend Hare's words is one of the most common features of the civil religion as it was to develop in the course of the war and as it had developed in other wars the belief that those who died for their country would gain an immediate heavenly reward. Their sacrifice was redemptive, not just for themselves, but for their country. One of the best analyses I've seen of this, uh, of this belief is by Adrian Gregory, who shows how comparisons between the soldier's self-sacrifice on the battlefield and Christ's crucifixion on the cross could develop into patri-passionism, which, Gregory argues, was the informal civic religion of wartime Britain. This civil religion was widely and informally adopted within the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, as indeed within most of the large mainstream denominations with a fairly loose membership. But there were many evangelicals and strictly Calvinist Presbyterians who formally opposed it. Gregory cites a pamphlet which was produced by the World Evangelic Alliance in 1918 to counteract this motion, this notion, sorry. And it was firmly rejected by divines of the Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland, very strongly Calvinist. The Reverend James Blair, minister of Milford Reformed Presbyterian Church in Donegal, said in a report to the 1918 annual meeting of the Reformed Synod of Ireland that the doctrine of salvation through personal sacrifice had found a prominent place in the teaching of many denominations but, quote, could hardly be described as other than satanic. But the evidence for it within mainstream Irish Presbyterianism is clear. It is to be found, for example, in obituary notices, which sadly, as the war went on, became increasingly a means of conveying patriotic and religious feelings. And this is one published in the February 1916 edition of the Presbyterian magazine, The Missionary Herald. It was written by the recently appointed editor, the Reverend W.B. McMurray of White Abbey Presbyterian Church, and concerned the death and action of 2nd Lieutenant Robert Wilson McDermott of the 8th Battalion of the Royal Irish Rifles, East Belfast Volunteers, who was a son of the very Reverend Dr. John McDermott, Minister of Belmont Presbyterian Church. After his law studies at Queen's, Robert McDermott was to have been called to the bar, but, wrote McMurray, he heard a more urgent call. The call of duty and honour. Scarcely had he answered it and gone forth bravely obedient to it 
when the highest call of all came. For him the last post was sounded, and he passed over to the side of his captain. His grave in the corner of that little French orchard, and those other graves in which the brave lads from many of our congregations have been buried, are eternal pledges of the loyalty of our Presbyterian Church to the call of empire and the cause of God. It would be difficult to find a more succinct formulation of that patriotic and religious duty as it was understood. The loyalty of our Presbyterian Church to the call of empire and the cause of God. And the call of empire and the cause of God were deemed synonymous. As the Presbyterian weekly newspaper The Witness proclaimed on the 14th of July 1916, we believe the nation's call and God's call are one. The civil religion I've described was manifested in many different forms of devotion. For example, in the use of hymns, which were permeated with military metaphors, what Oliver Anderson called warfare hymns. These were produced mostly by English and American writers in the latter half of the 19th century, and they came, they came into their own in wartime, when the original metaphors were given a literal meaning which was applied to the fighting and dying soldiers. I could give you a whole list of examples, just a couple. Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, written by an American Presbyterian minister with roots in Ballymoney. Or that staple hymn of so many Remembrance Day services, for all the saints who from their labours rest. You remember the lines, Oh, may thy soldiers, faithful, true and bold, fight as the saints who nobly fought of old, and win with them the victor's crown of gold. Another instance of words taken out of their original figurative context and given a literal and military application is the text from, Bible, from the Bible, <coughs> used as a sermon text, or used in an obituary, or in an in memoriam notice, or as an inscription on a war memorial. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Well done, thou good and faithful servant, or faithful unto death. The first of these is taken from the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. The second, Faithful Unto Death, is taken from Revelations, chapter 2, verse 10. I'll just read the, the verse in the authorised version. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now, if that was originally about imprisonment and martyrdom, now it's taken to be referring to death on the battlefield. With, when these phrases were used with reference to the fallen soldier, the conclusion of the text, the gaining of the heavenly reward, was not stated, but it certainly was implied. Uh, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Or, faithful unto death, I will give thee a crown of life. A great deal of Presbyterian patriotic war poetry was produced at this time as well. Some of it by women poets, such as Grace Norris or Lily Marcus of Londonderry, or much better known Amy Carmichael in India. Such poetry is a very far remove from the sort of First World War poetry that you're, you'll find in school books today. I think that one form of poetry produced during the war deserves much more attention than it has received. Poetry inserted in newspaper, obituary, and in memoriam notices. Now these notices are very sensitive to handle, because we're dealing with deep private emotions here. And they're sometimes rather crudely and naively expressed. Some of the poems are obviously composed by the bereaved relatives. A large number are, though, quotations, sometimes from people like Lawrence Binion. But these intimate feelings were published. They're on the public record. And these notices, I think, give a very significant insight into the public mood of the time. Just one example, taken from the Belfast Telegraph edition of the Monday the 2nd of July 1917. Now that date is significant, obviously. There are almost two and a half pages of in memoriam notices that day. And this is one in memory of rifleman William John Kinnear of Coburg Street. And the accompanying poem concludes, Bravely you marched into battle. Nobly your life laid down. You unto death were faithful, lad. Yours is the victor's crown. <coughs> There's also prose fiction, again mostly in newspapers and magazines, 
Just one example I'll give you. A book which was clearly designed to encourage Presbyterians to enlist. It's called Sons of Ulster. And it was published in 1916 by the Reverend Samuel Lindsay, Minister of Crescent Presbyterian Church on University Road, Belfast. One story tells of a wounded soldier who has come home to die. On his deathbed, he has a vision of his captain, Christ. He sits up at attention and salutes his captain before he dies. Another story is clearly aimed at persuading farmers' sons to enlist. And this is important, I think. It was probably this story which aroused some criticism from, from one reviewer in the Presbyterian magazine, Missionary Herald. The cold, hard figures of statistics, he said, prove that the young men in the country of this particular class were not worthy as a whole of having stories written about them. In other words, the reviewer still, in March 1918, is condemning the shirkers, who, men who did not answer the call. Throughout the war, the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church was most concerned with shirkers or slackers, men who were failing to do their duty to the king and to God, as they saw it. The first General Assembly meeting in wartime was in June 1915, when the Reverend Dr. D.A. Taylor, convener of the Committee on Social Service, addressed the Assembly on the impact of the war. He was formerly Minister of Second Cumber, also a former moderator. Two of his sons served in the Royal Army Medical Corps, and one was killed in July 1917. The inscription on his gravestone was, Faithful unto death. Now, back in June 1915, Dr. Taylor reported to the Assembly, during the, past social, during the past year, social service has largely taken the form of national sacrifice. The Church's outlook has been widened by the demands of the war and its call for patriotic ministry. And right nobly have our people res responded. The choicest of our young men have offered themselves as soldiers and sailors of the King, and not a few have laid down their lives in willing sacrifice. Our role of honour is already not unworthy of the best traditions of our people. But your committee regrets to report that while recruiting has been successful in urban centres, it is to be deplored that in rural districts our young men have not realised their duty to their country as they should have done. It seems to be quite the exception when farmers' sons join the flag. No doubt many of these cannot leave home for want of hands to do the work, but this does not seem to apply to vast numbers who seem to be shirking their duty. Your committee suggests that the Assembly should instruct ministers to appeal to young men to join the army in greater numbers. That resolution was passed, as was a request that the moderator should issue a pastoral letter on the subject. And this is what the, the moderator, the Right Reverend Professor Thomas Hamill, duly wrote to each congregational minister in 1915. As we all know, there is a widespread and rapidly growing desire that in this great crisis of our country's history, every man and woman should hear the call and be afforded opportunity to take share in national service and so hasten the day of victory. Appeals from the pulpit, though, didn't wholly have the effect desired, for at the following June Assembly, the same lament was made. It was accompanied by appreciation of the huge sacrifice that so many had made. Again, in June 1916, Dr. Taylor reported, The call for recruits is still urgent, and it is to be feared that many young Irishmen, especially in country districts who might be spared for service, are still shirking their duty. Your committee think the Assembly should make another appeal to those who are failing to do their part in the great struggle for righteousness and liberty, and are missing a golden opportunity of showing their loyalty and devotion to king and country. Dr. Taylor continued, while some are thus playing the part of Meroz in failing to come to the help of the Lord against the mighty foe, it is with deepest gratitude we report that our increasing rule of honour contains the names of a great host of our men who have jeopardised their lives, of some who have died for their country, of many more who have been wounded, and a long list of sons of ministers who show that the tide of patriotism runs nowhere higher than in the manses of our church. It is to be hoped that their good example may inspire many more to join the ranks and share the glory of those who are counted worthy to suffer for a cause so noble and so righteous. I must admit when I first read that paragraph I wondered who Meros was, who failed to come to the help of the Lord against the mighty foe. But those of you who know the book of Judges better than I did will recall that Meros was not a person but a city or possibly a, a clan. 
uh, whose inhabitants failed to come to the people, to the help rather, they failed to come to the help of the Israelites in their struggle against Caesarea and the Canaanites. They were therefore, these people of Meroz were cursed by the angel of the Lord. And I quote here from Judges 5.23 in the authorised version. Curse ye Meroz, said the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Now, I think here that Dr. Taylor was using Meroz merely as a metaphor for shirkers. It had often been used that way before, for instance, way back in the English Civil War. It was used in the 1770s by American revolutionaries to denounce loyalists who, according to the rebels, were failing to, quote, defend their country, religion and liberty. In 1915, the jingoistic Bishop of London, Arthur Winnington Ingram, wrote that if Britain had not come to the aid of Belgium, it would have been the Meroz of nations. I don't think that Dr. Taylor was suggesting that Presbyterian stay-at-homes would actually be cursed by God if they didn't join up and join God's cause. But later, in the January 1918 edition of the Missionary Herald, the editor of the magazine, and thus a prominent Presbyterian opinion maker, the Reverend W. McMurray of White Abbey, was more explicit in this regard. He said, the man who slinks away from duty deserves the curse pronounced against Meros. I rather doubt still if many of the Presbyterians who for one reason or another chose not to enlist actually feared that they were in danger of being cursed by God. There were too many excuses for not joining up. But such a fierce denunciation of shirkers does help to explain Presbyterian enthusiasm for conscription. Evidently exhortations from the pulpit were not enough. One of the most prominent members of the General Assembly in these years was the Reverend Dr. William Park, Minister of Rosemary Street Congregation in Belfast. He had been moderator back in 1890 and was a leader not only in Irish Presbyterianism. From 1913 to 1921, he was president of the General Presbyterian Alliance, the alliance of the Reformed churches throughout the world holding the Presbyterian system. Until the end of 1916, he wrote a monthly commentary on current affairs for the Missionary Herald magazine, in which he stressed the need for more Irish volunteers, and occasionally warned that conscription might prove necessary. For example, he wrote in August 1915, and if voluntary measures fail, we see clearly that compulsory service is looming ahead. And who dare complain about it, should it prove necessary for the protection of our country from a ruthless foe? He saw conscription as something looming, a future sad necessity, and not as something to be commended for its own sake, in the way, for instance, that Lord Roberts or Major General Henry Wilson had advocated it through the National Service League before the war. It's not surprising, therefore, that in the June 1918 Assembly, uh, Dr. Park spoke in support of conscription eloquently but resignedly. I'd like to move on now to the uh, assembly. Sorry, uh, before I come to 1918, just 1916, and say something about that assembly. Uh, it was after the Easter Rising, of course, and the, that assembly condemned the Easter Rising in the strongest of terms and commended its suppression. Sir William Crawford, GP, the convener of the Committee on the State of the Country, that's the Assembly Committee which dealt with political developments, he reported on an organisation, and he's referring here really to Sinn Féin, an organisation whose principal object was to throw over the government of the country and which did everything in its power to prevent any aid being given by those provinces, that is, provinces other than Ulster, to the imperial cause. The report added that the committee felt very strongly that the rebellion justifies from every point of view the determined opposition of the Presbyterians in Ireland to home rule and the consequences likely to follow from its adoption. Sir William Crawford, who presented that report, was one of the church's most prominent and influential laymen. He had been chairman director of the York Street flax spinning mill, former chairman of the board of the management of the Royal Victoria Hospital, President of the South Belfast Unionist Association. His Presbyterian pedigree was unchallengeable. He was the grandson of the first Presbyterian missionary to India, the son of a Presbyterian missionary in China, and the father of a Presbyterian missionary in China. He himself had served as clerk of session of Windsor Presbyterian Church for 26 years. No one played a greater role in shaping the Presbyterian policy on conscription. 
His view of conscription was amongst a number of individual opinions which were published in the Presbyterian weekly newspaper, The Witness, on the 12th of April 1918. That's just a couple of days after the House of Commons debate on conscription. And it was also three days after the day which saw the launching of the second major German Spring Offensive. None of the eminent gentlemen whom I'll quote could tolerate a link between conscription and home rule. And you remember that when Lloyd George was introducing conscription uh, in April, he gave a sop to the Irish nationalists by promising home rule to follow on. He didn't give very explicit details, but he promised that home rule would, would follow on. And of course, the Ulster Unionists and the Presbyterians along with them reacted very severely against that. For example, Reverend Dr. John Workman of Newton Breda Presbyterian Church in the Ormond Road. He was again conscription. I consider Lloyd George's scheme a monstrous proposal. Undoubtedly, conscription ought to have been applied to Ireland as well as Great Britain, but if a Home Rule Parliament were to be set up at present, it would be hostile to the Allies and favourable to Germany, so that Irish conscripts might be used to fight against British soldiers. And then Sir William Crawford, GP himself. Ulster is ready to bear all the burdens of war, but could not, to bear, not consent to bear those burdens if the advantages of the Union were lost. I think that's very significant. Ulster is ready to bear all the burdens of war, including conscription, but would not consent to bear those burdens if the advantages of Union were lost. In other words, if Home Rule were to be introduced. The implication of this is, if Home Rule was enforced as a concomitant to conscription, Ulster men would resist both. Another commentator in the witness who was quoted, Mr John Sinclair, Deputy Lieutenant, he argued that there should be no tribunals in Ireland to consider exemptions from conscription, for in Ireland such tribunals would exempt nationalists and send unionists to the front. And finally, Alderman John Tyrrell. He stated that if conscription had been applied three years earlier, we would have had a better Ireland today than we have. The General Assembly official policy on conscription was adopted at the Assembly on the 7th of June 1918. On that occasion, Sir William Crawford himself was unable to be present, and the report of his committee was presented by his minister, that is the minister of Windsor Presbyterian Church, the very Reverend Dr. John Irwin, who had just retired as moderator. So the following resolutions were moved by the Reverend Dr. John Irwin and seconded by the Reverend Dr. John McDermott. Dr. John McDermott, you remember, Minister of Belmont, moderator in 1903, and father of Robert McDermott, who was killed in January 1916. The following resolutions. One, that the report be received and adopted. Two, that the war now raging, forced upon us and our allies by the deliberate and cruel aggression of our enemies, must be prosecuted until the safety and freedom of the world has been secured, that is, until Germany has been thoroughly defeated. Three, that conscription, which the government has declared necessary to secure victory, and which has been enforced in Great Britain for the past two years, ought therefore in justice and in loyalty to the Constitution to be applied in Ireland. Four, that conscription, being solely a measure necessary for the defence of the Empire, has no connection with the question of home rule, and ought not to be mixed up with it, least of all during the crisis of a great war, and especially as it is certain that the granting of home rule, so far from removing the nationalist opposition to conscription, would only intensify it and strengthen it. Five, that while earnestly desiring to live on the friendliest terms with our Roman Catholic fellow countrymen, and wishing them to continue in the enjoyment of the same rights and liberties as ourselves, the Assembly cannot but feel the deepest regret that the archbishops and bishops of the Roman Catholic Church in Ireland should have thrown their great influence into the scale in support of the conspiracy against conscription at a time when it is absolutely necessary to maintain the strength of our forces in the field. The following two resolutions, seven and eight, deal at length with the Assembly's utter rejection of Home Rule. Now, these resolutions were passed. But not before an amendment was rejected, which proposed that resolutions 3 and 4 be omitted, but the rest passed. Now, resolutions 3 and 4 gave explicit support to conscription. Those are the ones which the amendment asked to be omitted. 
It could also, though, be argued that Resolution 5 gave implicit support to conscription. The amendment directly opposing conscription was proposed by the Reverend D.D. Boyle, Minister of McQuiston Memorial Church in the Castlereagh Road in Belfast, and a former Grand Master, a big part, a Grand Chaplain of the Independent Orange Order. For him, it was a question of the separation of powers. If conscription, to which he was not opposed in principle, were to be introduced, that was a matter for the secular arm, the war cabinet. It was not the church's place to endorse it. He questioned whether Jesus would have engaged in conscription. The Reverend Dr. James Denham Osborne, seconding the amendment, opposed conscription in Ireland not on theological grounds of principle, but on practical grounds. To do so, he argued, was not to be a traitor to unionism. He was joint minister of the Abbey Church in Dublin. Its congregation had come into being through a merger with that of Union Chapel, which had been destroyed in the Easter Week shelling. And uh, Osborne had been in uh, Dublin during that time. Earlier, he had ministered in Balamone and had been an associate of the Redmondite and home ruler, Reverend G.B. Armour. Now, what Osborne had seen in Dublin convinced him that conscription was unenforceable, especially in the south and west of Ireland. He warned of, quote, terrible, hideous, shocking results without any adequate gain to the empire. Was the Presbyterian Church going to take up a position adopted by no other church in Ireland? Were they going to say to the government, although many things may happen, although thousands of young men and young girls may die, although young priests may court the rifles of your soldiers, go on. Don't hesitate to shoot. The Reverend J.B. Armour of Ballymoney, the Rev. veteran campaigner and lion of lost causes, as one of his assembly contemporaries called him, joined his friends, the Reverends Boyle and Osborne, in speaking against conscription. Earlier, though, when writing to his son William on the 24th of April, he seems to have considered that Irish conscription might be necessary for the winning of the war. But now, on the 7th of June, he told the assembly that from his observation, more ordinary Presbyterians were against conscription than for it. This opinion evoked some vocal scepticism, which wouldn't have phased him though. Those who were against conscription faced vigorous opposition from the dominant figure in the assembly, Reverend Dr. William Park of Rosemary Street. I've mentioned how back in 1915 he had written that conscription would perhaps be needed in Ireland. Now, in June 1918, he insisted that the Assembly could not oppose the government's demands, which must be enforced. He did not believe that this would cause bloodshed, because, he said, when a common-sense proposition was put before them, when their emotions and hearts were appealed to, and when a firm hand held the reins of government in the country, Irishmen were always ready to respond. But he added that any bloodshed which might ensue in Ireland would not compare with the bloodshed which would be saved at the battlefront. For bloodshed at the front would be a hundred times worse than any in Ireland. If the war was to be won, he argued, the whole force of the empire must come into the fight. He only wished, he concluded, that all Ireland was with them, which was perhaps a bit of a contradiction with what he was saying earlier. So Crawford McCulloch, Another leading Presbyterian layman amongst Belfast merchant princes also disagreed with the amendment. He had been Belfast's Lord Mayor from 1914 to 1917. In 1915, he was head of recruitment for the Northern Division of Ulster, and he also chaired an inaugural meeting of the anti-German union in the Ulster Hall. And in 1917, he was a unionist delegate to the convention called to tackle the question of home rule. He was a member of White Abbey Presbyterian Church. He admitted that the government appeared to have abandoned conscription, but he feared that it would be disappointed by its alternative scheme of voluntary recruitment. He argued that the resolution did not go far enough. The Assembly should have called upon the government definitely to govern the country, to do its duty, and to bring in conscription for Ireland. The applause which greeted that appeal indicates the general sentiment of the Assembly and the amendment against conscription was defeated by a show of hands by a large majority. One point that Sir Crawford made was important, that since the government was now pushing hard for voluntary recruitment, it seemed to have abandoned its plans for conscription in Ireland. Mm -hmm. of course, denied it. That morning, on the 7th of June, delegates to the Assembly could have read in the witness 
the Lord Lieutenant's proclamation calling for 50,000 recruits is regarded as an indication, if not an intimation, that conscription has been abandoned in Ireland. And a month earlier, in a letter to the press, Sir Edward Carson questioned whether the government really intended to enforce conscription. I was going to talk about the non-subscribing prospect Presbyterians, but perhaps I should leave that out. I would just like to conclude by coming back to Malone Presbyterian Church briefly. Eight years after our first visit, this is now Sunday morning, 8th of October 1922, when the church's war memorial organ was dedicated. The former minister of the congregation, the Reverend James Hare, now Professor Hare, took part in the service, but it was planned and led by the new minister, Reverend Gilbert Payton. He had served as a chaplain in the war, where his gallantry had gained him an MC in two bars. On the 13th of June 1922, the Reverend Payton told his congregational committee that he planned to invite Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson to unveil the memorial and the very Reverend Dr John Sims to preach the sermon. In 1918, Sir Henry Wilson had become Chief of the Imperial General Staff, and particularly after the German Spring Offensive of that year, he had vehemently urged that Irish men should be conscripted. He retired from the army in February 1922 with the rank of Field Marshal and was elected unopposed to Westminster as Ulster Unionist MP for North Down. In the House of Commons, he used his caustic eloquence to defend unionism and to castigate what he saw as the British government's cowardly failure to stand up to the IRA. He saw the 1920 Anglo-Irish Treaty as an object surrender to murderers. And he wrote in a private letter on the 11th of June 1922, all my energies, public and private, are devoted to get rid of that, getting rid of that pack of cards in the present cabinet. His particular bit noir were Lloyd George and Winston Churchill. Wilson and Sims each had presided over many war memorial dedications. Wilson, for example, at the Tite Valtar in France. He had accepted the invitation to lay the foundation stone of the largest cenotaph in Ulster, the Antrim Memorial at Noca, on the 7th of October 1922, so he seems to have aimed to be in Northern Ireland that weekend, on the day, at any rate, before the planned unveiling of the Malone Memorial. I don't know whether he accepted or even received the invitation to come to Malone, because nine days after that Congregational Committee meeting, he was shot dead on the steps of his London home, by two members of the London Battalion of the IRA. Reverend Dr. Sims, he was able to accept the invitation to preach the sermon. In the war, he had been not only the senior Irish Presbyterian chaplain, but the principal chaplain to the British forces. He had retired from the army with the rank of Major General, though he remained honorary chaplain to the King. In 1919 to 20, he had been moderator of the General Assembly. Like Wilson, he had also become a politician, for at a Westminster by-election on the 21st of July 1922, he was chosen to succeed Wilson as Unionist MP for North Town. Sims appears to have taken, only, not only, taken over not only Wilson's political mantle, but also some of his sentiments and even tone of voice. Politics and religion were so deeply intertwined here 100 years ago, it's often very difficult to distinguish between words delivered at the inauguration of a war memorial in the pulpit or at electoral hustings. This is from a report of Dr. Sims' sermon at Wellington Street Church, Ballymena, on the 2nd of July 1922, less than three weeks before his election as MP. In these days, they, that is the congregation, in these days they had seen the old flag for which they fought trampled underfoot by the scum of the earth. <laughs> by the valour of our sons, we won the war. By the folly and incompetence of our government, we ran great, risk, great risks of losing the peace. In the Malone pulpit on the 8th of October, he preached on the text Hebrews 11:13. These all died in faith. Another good example, I think, of how in those days a biblical quotation could be taken out of context and given a military twist to suggest here that the Malone men who had died in the war were to be numbered among the heroes of faith and among the saints in glory. This is how the Northern Whig reported his sermon. He denied that the true spirit of militarism was an evil thing, as he had heard it described, and the old contemptibles, the territorials and Kitchener's men, were fused together and had turned the whole army into a school of chivalry such as the world had never seen before. Supporting the law of conscription, 
he expressed the view that if that law had been applied to Ireland in the early days of the war, this country would have been saved the welter of blood and the inhuman actions of men that had been experienced during the intervening years. It was faith that had helped those men, that is, the British Army, it, is, it was faith that had helped those men to fight as they did, and it was their faith that won through. They never doubted the holiness of their cause, and they knew they were out to resist a tyranny that would have destroyed their motherland. Over one million of those gallant fellows never returned. Truly, that was a great price for freedom, a freedom which many in their midst seemed sadly to misuse, which, a freedom which, won by brave men, was being trampled underfoot by the scum of the earth. Because of the men who died, they, that is the congregation, lived anew today and held a trust which they must never betray. The comment on conscription shows us that some Presbyterian attitudes to conscription were fairly persistent. The 1918 General Assembly voted overwhelmingly in favour of conscription in Ireland, although they must have known that it would not be implemented. That vote was primarily a political gesture, an expression of their loyalty to crown and empire, an expression of their antagonism to the Roman Catholic Church and the disloyalty, as they saw it, of pan-nationalism, and above all, an expression of their antipathy to Sinn Féin with, as they saw it, Sinn Féin's German allies. In general, however, General Assembly resolutions about conscription were determined by a sense that duty must be done. Duty to the King and Empire, and duty to God. Now, I don't know if there's any truth in the Reverend J.B. Armour's contention that in 1918 most ordinary Presbyterians were against conscription. But in view of all the denunciations of Presbyterian shirkers, which continued well into 1918, if compulsory service had been implemented in Ireland, there would have been, would have been quite a few very reluctant Presbyterian conscripts. And after the war, at least one prominent Presbyterian still believed that if conscription had been introduced and enforced early in the war, Sinn Féin could have been defeated, and the course of Irish history could have been very different. Think of it. If conscription had been realised, there would have been no Doyle, no Irish independence, no Northern Ireland. I doubt it. Are you okay to take a couple of questions before we break? Uh, after breaking, and take a couple. Yes. Who likes to go first? Can I ask Tim a question? Yes. Okay. This is one of the people I mentioned here, Reverend Workman. Uh, of his eleven children, uh, five of his, three of his five sons were in the army, and two of his six daughters were in the Women's Royal, Royal Air Force. Now, I think they probably joined in 1918. Would women have been counted towards these numbers of volunteers? Uh, no. no. Just women, men. women are deemed to be auxiliaries uh -huh. in the first and the second world war, so yes, that's not their talk about it, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Tim, just given the level of casualties at the Somme on the 1st of July for the Ulster Division, uh -huh. you think Home Rule started to play an influence and recruitment within unionism after that? I'll give you the context of that. In Tyrone, which I've done a wee bit of research about, recruitment into the ninth in the skill was done by personal interview after the saw. There were no big recruitment campaigns, so it seemed to be that higher authorities were starting to think <coughs> in two different tranches. Mm. Um. The assumption that you're making is that recruitment before the saw was going well from a, a sort of Unionist or Army perspective, perhaps. Um, there's an awful lot of trouble raising those rural units of the Ulster Division. So you get these big recruiting parades in Belfast in September and into October. But, um, it, well, it says a lot of things if you're looking at the, the ninth, is what you're after in Jerome. Um, you know, the, a lot of their recruits at Haring Furs. Now, who turns up at Haring Furs? Unemployed labourers who are looking to sign on for six months with a farmer. So that's the same sort of people that were joining the army pre-war. So uh, you can see that they're, they're really sort of having problems recruiting at that stage. And you know, if you look at some of the recruiting literature, and um, there's a book in the ninth, Anna Skillens, isn't there? I'm trying to remember who the author of that is. Uh, 
who reproduces some of these posters, you can see that you know, they're, they're doing route marches and things all the way into February and March 1915. To, to get numbers together. Once you get beyond that, you know, there's any number of, of themes that, that, that come up. Um, Empire, I think, is a dominant one that comes up in all sorts of recruiting events. This personal bit's very important. There's a lot of appeals made to family, and Paul, who's the first Major General uh, commanding the Ulster Division, he has, in his Christmas 1914 speech, uh, a message to the Division that men should go home and use their family connections and get their friends involved. So I think you're starting to see that uh, back, in, back in December. So I think what you're getting after the song um, is maybe not that different to some of the things that were happening in sort of spring 1915. A little bit of to say is that there's no real budget for recruitment for individual battalions. So when you see things in some of the local papers, uh, it's the Constitution, but oh my God, true Constitution. Um, I think that that's the the commanding officer Ricardo who's paying for those ads himself so some units you're, you're not really getting much of an advertising campaign others it's, it's During spring offensive, it's long intrigued me uh, ever since I, I read this book was probably no stranger uh, to a lot of it uh, Martin Middlebrook's excellent Kaiser's Battle published in 1978 and I first read in the 1980s uh, what drew my interest particularly was that he included details of interviews of men from the 36th uh, and of the German forces opposite them. But unfortunately, the book only deals with the first day of the battle, which left me wanting to find out more. To many in this part of the world, the Great War is the song, and there are countless books that would have been a struggle. Uh, by contrast, however, there are very few which detail the events of March 1918, which resulted in greater casualties to the Ulster Division. There are a few other recent books which deal with the uh, Spring Offensive, Retreat and Rearguard Song by Jerry Merlin, and Song Offensive March 1918 by uh, Andrew Rawson, being two. They both mentioned the 36th, uh, but both are general studies of the entirety of the offensive, and by necessity cannot devote much time to the actions of specific battalions. So what I wish to do this afternoon is to bring to you uh, some details of the experiences of local men which to date I feel haven't been given uh, the exposure that they deserve. Quick comparison of casualties in the Somme and St. Quentin, uh, 1918. You can see 5,482 at the Somme uh, and 6,109. That may not even be strictly correct, it's the best figure I can come up with. So why is, why is there so little written about uh, 1918 compared to 1916? First and second of July, uh, casualties of the 36th Ulster Division, 1935. 1517 were from the province of Ulster. <coughs> Fast forward to 1918, 966, and that's a figure that I have come up with by painstaking research to work out men who were attached to the 36th Ulster Division during that week. Of those, 442 from the province of Ulster. So it's purely the number of dead that there's less interest in. Was it war weariness? War's been going on for three and a half years, no longer the, the story that once was. My belief is that 1918 was partially perceived as a defeat, and therefore something to be hidden. But I don't believe that it was. There were some background figures leading up to the, uh, the German offensive. The Russian Revolution. The Russians would be fighting the Germans in the Eastern Front with varying degrees of success as part of the Entente Cordiale and be tying up considerable German resources. The Germans realised if Russia was out of the war, free up resources for a massive attack on the Western Front before the Americans uh, entered the war. The last throw of the dice, uh, if you will. Lack of reinforcements has already been alluded to here in previous speakers. Prime Minister Lloyd George and the Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig had little time for each other. The Prime Minister blamed Haig for the massive losses during the traditional battles of 1917, particularly at Passchendaele. The reason if he didn't send reinforcements, Haig couldn't use them, uh, and what Lloyd George saw as wasteful offensives. So with no re reinforcements coming, Haig was forced to reorganise. Reorganisation uh, in the the winter of 1917-1918 saw the loss of 145 <coughs> infantry battalions uh, through disbandment and amalgamations. 
And reinforcements, as we've already heard, have always been a problem for the 36th. There simply weren't enough men. What we saw in reorganisation was regular Irish battalions joining the division to maintain an Irish, if not a, a holy author, Ulster ethos. The agreement to take over was well, from then from the French again, something of the duplicity of, of Lloyd George. He agreed this at a meeting with the French without telling Haig, and in fact, after the meeting with the French, he went to visit Haig and never told him about it. He, he was informed by letter three days later, so you can imagine his reaction. I wasn't really impressed with the whole thing. Uh, they had to take over an extra bit of line from the French. The French were in no position really to carry out any offensive <coughs> actions, and really, with the mutinies that had taken place in 1917, their army was in a fairly poor state. New defensive system imposed because of the fact that they had to, to reorganise, and they knew that there was a, a massive German offensive coming. British had been on the offensive since the end of September 1914 and now had to prepare a defensive system which had never been tried before. Uh, it was a continental system uh, of redoubts, uh, not a continuous front line redoubts, sort of fortified areas, of, uh, strong points surrounded by barbed wire. Uh, never been tried before. <laughs> nobody had any knowledge of it and worse still, nobody had any confidence in it. And this baffles me completely in all the research I've done. There's a total lack of urgency, knowing that a German offensive, a massive German offensive was coming and that your defences were not complete. They knew from the beginning of March, roughly, that the German offensive would happen sometime around about the third week in March. Um, the great problems getting their defences um, constructed because of lack of, of manpower. St. Patrick's Day on the 17th of March was a designated a holiday for the entire 5th Army uh, and that was not just units that had Irish uh, battalions within it, they, they took a day off. Uh, they had uh, horse shows, they had football matches, they had sporting, various sporting events, cooking events, uh, they had dinners in the evening where they entertained officers from different uh, regiments and um, I, I can't my head around the, the only thing I, 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 reason I can come across it uh, from um, Sir Hubert Goff's memoirs. He equates it to Wellington before the Battle of Waterloo, where Wellington attended a, a ball in Brussels. And, and that was his rationale for it, but it seems just completely bizarre uh, in the attempt. 36th Ulster Division in March 1918, very much different from uh, what existed in uh, 1915. We've brought in the regular battalions, so still three brigades, 107th, um, two regular. Uh, battalions, 1st and 2nd Rifles, and 15th North Belfast Volunteers. <coughs> 108th uh, Regular Battalion, 1st Royal Irish Fusiliers, with the 9th Royal Irish Fusiliers who had an influx from the North Irish Horse, their own strength, and the 12th Royal Irish Rifles, the Central Alton Volunteers. 109th Brigade, very much at the, at the insistence of Major General Nugent, who just a question of he has no relation to me whatsoever. Uh, he wanted an Inniskillings Brigade, and uh, he got an Inniskillings Brigade. Two regular battalions, uh, the 1st and 2nd, and the 9th, the, the interim volunteers. You can see that the uh, battalions have been disbanded here. The 6th Royal Irish Rifles uh, Battalions, and the, the 10th and 11th Royal Inniskillings Fusiliers. Now, the extra men left over from reorganisation, and this is uh, something which hasn't been looked at a lot, I think, and uh, the implications of it. The around 3,000 men were left over, uh, and they were formed into three entrenching battalions, the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd entrenching battalions, and they were basically neighbour battalions, and one of the main things they did, they took their Lewis guns off them, so their main infantry support weapon was taken off them, and they were put to work constructing roads, constructing aerodromes, um, working on railways, but crucially, they were removed from the 36th Division and came under core control. So they had no, uh, the 36th Division had no access to these resources of, of local men from here who knew the systems of the 36th Ulster Division. They were taken away to do, to do other jobs. I think it was a horrendous mistake. <coughs> so this is the front line, and uh, uh, this is the area of the 36th held on the uh, 21st of March. Um, first thing that struck me when I, I first saw this map is that 
Uh, the divisional line doesn't run square on to the German line. It runs from northeast to southwest. Um, this area here was held by the 14th Light Division. Uh, and in fact, the brigade that was holding this area, the 41st Brigade, was a brigade that Major General Nugent commanded before he was appointed as, as uh, the divisional commander of the 36th. Uh, up on this side, the 30th Division uh, were here. Uh, as I mentioned, the defensive system was based on redoubts, so uh, 108th Brigade we have here in the morning of the, the 21st, we have the 12th Royal Irish Rifles here. And they're near supporting battalion are the first Royal Irish Fusiliers who are back here at the station to be out. Uh, and that's about two miles away. Racecourse readout, which has, uh, it was built on a railway embankment and it has a, a railway line running through it. The 15th Royal Irish Rifles were there. They're supporting battalion, uh, first Royal Irish Rifles were a quarry readout. Second one is Skillings up in Bodicea here. Another most interesting one because their supporting battalion is the first Royal Irish Fusiliers who are Ricardo readout. What you see is that there, the river, the Somme River and the St. Quentin Canal run between the two. And this is all marshy ground. So the chances of the second one of Skillings getting any support from the first really is uh, it's not going to happen. The battalions in reserve uh, were around Grand Circle, down around here. And that's four to five miles to the rear from the guys in, in the front line here. <coughs> knew themselves and joked about the fact that they were sacrificed battalions, they knew when the Germans attacked they'd be more wrong. From my research, the three battalions in the, in the front uh, line in the, the morning of uh, the 21st of March numbered probably between 2,200 and 2,500 at, at most. The Germans attacked on the Ulster Division front with three divisions, that's around 45,000 men, so heavily outnumbered. Well, here's the opposition. The man on the left, General Oscar von Goudier, commander of the German 18th Army. And the guy on the right is Oberst or Colonel Jörg Bruchmuller. Uh, he was known as Dirk Bruchmuller, Breakthrough Muller, as translated. He was renowned for his ability uh, to work out how many artillery pieces were needed for a barrage and what sort of barrage was needed, be it high explosive, shrapnel, gas, smoke, <coughs> to soften up defences before infantry were committed. Both men had outstanding success at the Battle of Riga uh, against the Russians in September 1917 and at Caporetto against the Italians uh, in October of that year. So the knowledge of the presence of these two men on the battlefield should have alerted the Allies to the form the German attack was, was uh, going to take. The Germans assembled 10,000 artillery uh, pieces on their attack front, uh, roughly 6,500 uh, field guns and three and a half thousand trench mortars. They planned a five hour bombardment which used one million one hundred and sixty thousand rounds. Now if you contrast that with the British bombardment uh, at the Somme which lasted a week it used one million five hundred thousand so that's in a week the Germans used nearly that in five hours. Um, by working on my long division it uh, works at 65 rounds a second <laughs> Okay, the morning of the 21st, as I mentioned, an entry attack for the five hour bombardment. The fog was so thick that visibility was less than 10 yards. Now, this hadn't been predicted. Mist had been predicted both by British Army and German Army meteorologists. Uh, thick fog hadn't, but that's what they got in the morning and caught both sides out. Uh, obviously, favoured the Germans most uh, and enabled them to infiltrate into the 36th division positions without being seen. <coughs> uh, we have the roads, they used the roads. Um, they came across the country as well. Jean d'Arc Redoubt, um, 12th Town Royal Irish Rifle, was surrounded and captured at 11 a.m., about an hour and 15 minutes after the, the German infantry attack started. Forward positions of the uh, 12th Rifles, however, were unaware um, that the, the uh, Redoubt had been captured. Um, they had had some artillery bombardment early in the morning and then that was lifted from them and they hadn't seen anything after that at all. They hadn't seen any Germans on foot. C Company, the 12th <coughs> Rifles are in Foucault Trench at the front here. Uh, they're commanded by 22 years old Captain Leslie Johnson. Uh, before the war he was an insurance agent, commercial union in Donegal Square North in Belfast. At 1pm 
Foglifts. Uh, he can see miles behind him, Germans, all he can see is Germans. Um, and in front of him, on this road, is a convoy, a uh, horse drawn convoy, German logistics convoy coming down the road. So, what's he there for? He opens fire with his men and they annihilate the convoy completely, destroy everything in it men, horses, everything. Now, the Germans, with their stormtrooper tactics, they're pushing this way as fast as they can. They're leaving areas like Cap uh, Captain Johnson's for more conventional infantry units to come in and mob all the time. <coughs> so Germans have to deal with them. So Captain Johnson's in those trenches. He's probably about 100, 150 men at most with him. The Germans <coughs> launched an attack uh, with two battalions. <coughs> One of these. They had two tanks. One was a captured British tank and the other one was this. It's the A7V Stern Panzerwagen. It has a crew of 18. Uh, you can see on the front, it's a 57mm cannon uh, and I have six maximum machine guns firing from, from these ports. Uh, accompanying that were stormtroopers armed with, with flamethrowers. So they're heavily outnumbered. Captain Johnson and his men held out until 3pm, sustaining heavy casualties. And they surrendered at 3 p.m. to avoid unnecessary loss of life. From my research, 12 rifles uh, went into battle with 22 officers and 566 other ranks. All were reported missing. 36 men were killed, <coughs> the vast majority being taken prisoner. The gentleman on the left will probably be familiar to many of you. Second left hand ever to win. <coughs> We'll have the, the 12th Rifles, as I mentioned, to their left of the 15th Royal Irish Rifles a race course readout. They had a similar experience due to the fog. Second Lieutenant De Wind was in the forward position and he fought his way back to the readout <coughs> with two NCOs, held the Germans at bay for many hours. And this is one of the NCOs on the right, uh, Corporal Samuel Getgood, um, and he's from the Crumlin Road in Belfast. The commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel um, Cole Hamilton, wrote after the, the battle. Second Lieutenant De Wind, Corporal Getgood and Lance Corporal Walker did splendid work clearing Contest Court Communications <coughs> Trench, which ran from Racecourse Redoubt down towards the village of, of Contest Court, time after time. Twice they got out on top and walked along it, clearing enemy of it with rifle and grenades. They all three won the Victoria Cross several times. Second Lieutenant De Wind was killed uh, and received the posthumous Victoria Cross. Corporal Samuel Getgood and Lance Corporal uh, George Hubert Walker, who was from Leopold Street, his father was a, a, an RIC man stationed in Leopold Street. Uh, he already held a military medal. They were both uh, wounded and taken prisoner. In 1920, they were both awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal without citation. Uh, Samuel Getgood's an interesting character. He emigrates to America, uh, takes American citizenship. He lives until in 1989, he died about 97 or 98 years of age. Whilst 15th rifles were fighting for their lives, the Germans <coughs> bypassed them, as I mentioned, but the same with the 12th, and they came uh, upon the 1st Battalion Royal Irish Rifles at Quarry Readout. This man was, some of you may, may know, Captain John Brown, MC and Bar, a commanding officer of, of B Company, 1st uh, Royal Irish Rifles. They held up the advance of German Infantry Regiment uh, 463 near Quarry Redoubt for most of the afternoon, and indeed the Germans did not proceed past Quarry Redoubt until the First Royal Irish Rifles were directed to withdraw later in the evening. Captain Brown's from Bloomfield, East Belfast. He enlisted as a rifleman in the 8th Battalion, East Belfast Volunteers, in September 1914, and obtained his commission in the same battalion in <coughs> November of that year. He was wounded on the first day of the psalm, shot in the shoulder. Uh, and was awarded the military cross. He was on convalescent leave at home. Uh, he saved the youth from drowning in the River Lagan <coughs> and was awarded the Royal Humane Society Bronze Medal. When he had recovered, he was posted to the 1st Battalion and he was awarded a bar to his military cross in May 1917. Uh, this is the, the family headstone to Dunn's Cemetery. Um, you can just make out there the uh, Captain of 1st Royal Irish Rifles. He was killed in action near St. Quentin. 21st of March, 1918. <coughs> so by the end of the, the 21st of, of March, 
um, first of all, Division had held this area. They had now been ordered to withdraw to this side, uh, this side of the river. The withdrawal was completed successfully, except in one uh, notable case. Um, the Ninth Royal Irish Fusiliers, a company, um, were lost because the fog had come down again. There's another interesting thing: fog had come down again in the evening. Uh, um, a company, Ninth Royal Irish Fusiliers, had uh, lost. Um, the commanding officer sent out a runner. He came back and says, "I can't find them." Um, the <laughs> commanding officer said, "Yeah, I just can take out Egypt with you. I won't find them." Um, and he did find them, but on their way back, they ran into uh, a large German patrol, and the entire company was captured. So the following morning, um, the order was given to blow the bridges uh, to stop the German advance. So all these villages here um, have to be upon, etc. They all in Saint Simon. They have um, bridges uh, connecting both sides. And this is where the division was second Victoria Cross in two days. Lieutenant Cecil Leonard Knox, the 150th Field Company Royal Engineers from Nuneaton in Warwickshire. This rather industrial looking bridge. <laughs> Um, I, I took a picture last year when I was, I was over researching. It was the main crossing at Tunier Pont. Morning of the 22nd, it was one of the, the bridges allocated to uh, Lieutenant Knox to destroy. About 9 a.m., he's going to ready to blow the bridge. An artillery detachment from another division appears looking to cross, and the major in charge recorded, I have not used my authority to force him to let us cross over before he pressed the button. A few minutes later, we'd all been stranded. When they were clear, and the Germans are literally on the bridge, Lieutenant Knox pressed the button, nothing happened. He ran to the bridge, pulled out the fuse, pushed in an instantaneous fuse, and blew the bridge up on top of himself. The bridge destroyed, miraculously he survived. He was presented with Victoria Cross by King George V uh, in the field in August 1918. He was one of nine brothers who served, <coughs> two of whom were killed. Uh, and in a parallel with, with Blair Main, Cecil Knox was killed in a, a motorbike accident in 1943 when he skidded nice near his home. So while the division, the vast majority of the division, has, has been getting a lot of attention from the Germans on the 21st, the 1st Battalion Royal and Skilling Fusiliers, as I mentioned, are here at Ricardo Redoubt. And really, they got a bombardment on the morning of the 21st and nothing happened and after that. This is our commanding officer. Uh, he is Lieutenant Colonel James Norman Crawford, DSO, been with the regiment since 1901. He commanded the Second and Skillings at the Battle of Festibar in uh, 1915. Because of their location, Germans' attentions were on the Second Wiltshire's, who were at Leaping Dadao, and they had suffered similarly to the, to the uh, 36th Division battalions on this side of the river surrounded and surrounded and cut off. At 11 a.m. on the morning of the 22nd, German infantry uh, approached from Fontaine Le Clair. So, although the Ulster Division had all come back to this side, the Germans were coming down and forcing them backwards. <coughs> the German 1st Foot Guard Regiment were a Prussian unit, one of the elite of the German army. Uh, the, they attacked the Innisgillings position at Ricardo. Inniskillings repulsed repeated attacks from this unit and then they brought up the 3rd Foot Guard Regiment to assist them and they repulsed their attacks until 4.30 in the afternoon when overwhelmed. Major General Nugent later wrote in his diary, The 1st Battalion Inniskilling Fusiliers are the heroes of this division. Their duty was to hold a readout in the main line and they held it to the end. No man came back from it. They beat back 12 different attacks made we believe by the 1st Guard Division of the Prussians. And at the last, those who were watching from other places said that the Germans just poured over in a wave, but none of the Inniskillings came back. They were ordered to hold the line, and they held it to the end. On that day, the first Inniskillings had 551 casualties. <coughs> on the 23rd, things are getting rather confused as, as the uh, uh, division withdraws. This slightly shaded area is where the bridge started the day off at. Um, now this area here, from San Simon down towards UC, it was being held by the 61st Infantry Brigade. They had been attached to the division from lunchtime on the 21st of March, and they comprised the 12th Battalion King's Liverpool Regiment, 7th Battalion Duke Cornwall's Light Infantry, and 7th Battalion Somerset Light Infantry. 
However, the Germans were pushing to try and cross and push the 36th back here, but they were also coming around this way, by as you see, and pushing this way. So again, the retreat was uh, working southwest, southwestwards. This is an example of the confusion that, that has occurred, and it's not, it's not the only one. Company Sergeant Major Robert Hamilton, originally from uh, just outside Dungillen. Company Sergeant Major at 22, he's from excellent soldier. Ready to hold her the military medal, which was won at the Somme. His DCM was, was won in action near uh, Bruchy, which uh, the 9th and the Scully Fusiliers uh, gained and lost twice on the, on the 23rd. The citation states, uh, he was awarded on, on the 23rd, I know that, um, citation states, when holding the line during the following days, well, if he was killed on the 23rd, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission states he couldn't have been doing anything in the following days. <laughs> uh, the records that are held here are of interest Lund Derry Memorial Records. Uh, they le include letters that were sent out to family members to have their loved ones included on the Lund Derry War Memorial. His mother, uh, on receipt of the letter, has scored out the 23rd and then the 26th in hand. So it's likely that he was killed on the 26th. And, and he's not the only one that there is this confusion. I know um, a lot of people are not sure whether they're here today or not, but their relative, Sergeant James Hughes, DCM, MM, uh, Commonwealth War Graves Commission states he was killed on the 21st. Um, the family know for a fact he was killed on the 23rd. Uh, but it's trying to get, trying to prove it and getting the, the Commonwealth War Graves <coughs> Commission to, to change their records is exceptionally difficult. 24th of March, following day, um, <coughs> most crucial day for the division, without any shadow of a doubt. Fast moving German stormtroopers, constantly pushing them backwards. You don't have to be a military genius to see that the position held by the 36th is, <laughs> there's a bit of a problem with it, uh, it resembles an S. Uh, they were meant to be in touch with the 30th on their left and the 14th division on their right, and from then on, really, they never got in touch with them. And, and this situation, as you can expect, is, is, is ripe for exploitation by the Germans. The next two, well, the farm, you know, the next, the next two slides are pictures of fields, but fields of massive importance. This field is on the eastern outskirts of the village of Cooney, which went back to that previous map, I can maybe show you where it is. Yeah, right down the bottom is the village of Cooney. In the morning of the 24th, 2nd Battalion Royal Irish Rifles are in this field, around 400 strong. 12th Battalion King's Liverpool Regiment with the 61st Infantry Brigade, some are on their right, but they never got in touch with them. On their left were the 7th Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry and the 9th in the Skillings. However, 2nd Royal Irish, Royal Irish Rifles are facing this way, the DCLI and the 9th in the Skillings are facing this way, because the Germans are attacking from this side. The second Royal Irish Rifles were ordered to withdraw, but again, don't have to be any good military genius to work out. There's very little cover there to withdraw with. Uh, they were on their third commanding officer in three days. Uh, the others haven't been killed or wounded. Um, the commanding officer is 27 year old Captain Joseph Browns uh, from Liverpool. They decided to stand and fight. The official history states that they were attacked by two regiments of the German Guard Division. Cyril Falls in the Rifles Regimental History states the attack, accompanied by a flight of low flying aeroplanes, swept in an overwhelming strength from the left, and a desperate hand to hand fight ensued. When the Germans finally closed, many men had not around left to fire. They sprang from their entrenchments and met the enemy with bayonets. In a few minutes, it was all over. The defenders were simply engulfed by superior numbers. Of the 400, only 10 men escaped. 96 were killed. These are two guys who were killed. Uh, at the top here, we have Rifleman John Best from Woodford Street in Peters Hill area of Belfast. He was killed a month of the day before his 20th birthday. And also 19, Rifleman Victor Barnes, he was from White House in County Henry. Another field. Or rather, two fields. After the Second Royal Irish Rifles had been uh, overrun, what up until then had been a fairly orderly withdrawal threatened to turn into a rout, and, and that's documented by uh, different accounts. 
not publicised a lot, but it's documented by a lot of accounts. Uh, what happened in these fields undoubtedly saved the Ulster Division. The Germans are in strength, flush of success, have just run over the Second Royal Irish Rifles. Uh, Stormtrooper units coming out of this tree line, coming across the fields, pursuing the, the ninth, uh, 7th DCLI, 9th and Scullings, and the rest. Um, small units, light machine guns, moving fairly quickly. <coughs> Up to this time in the war, cavalry had largely, largely been redundant. However, a detachment of the 6th Cavalry Brigade, comprising elements of the 1st and 3rd Royal Dragoons and the 10th Hussars, were in the vicinity in support of infantry, and they used their initiative. Every, every time I think of this, it makes the hair stand on the back of my neck. From behind a large farm complex, and I took this photograph, farm complex still in existence, it's on my, it's on my uh, left. From behind a large farm complex came 150 horses in line. Orders were given and they charged the stormtroopers who were caught in the open and they were cut down with sabres. This is 1918. You know, we thought this, this had long been gone. Around 100 Germans were killed, 100 taken prisoner and the cavalry sustained three fatalities. But the important, and the crucially important thing is when the cavalry charged, the Ulster Division infantry men, who had previously been running that way, turned and ran that way after the Germans and inflicted further casualties on them. So it was a massive morale boost to them. Uh, it gave the hard pressed infantry men crucial time to consolidate and reorganise. However, it was only temporary and the retreat continued. The 25th With all military operations that are go wrong, but in early stage they tend to look for a scapegoat, and the, the scapegoat uh, in this occasion is General Sir Hubert Goff. Uh, his operational control of the area south of the Somme, which belonged to the 5th Army, was taken from him in the early hours of the 25th and passed to the French. The 36th Ulster Division came under command of the French 62nd Infantry Division in order to move to this area, um, which is just north of the, of the town of Roy. Um, to block the German advance, again they were to meet up with the 30th Division, and they, no, they never did, they weren't able to do it. Because by the time they reached this area, the Germans had taken on the sheep. Uh, 36th got to Ursh first, but the Germans put them out of it in the evening of the, 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 uh, or the afternoon of the 26th. The situation was very fluid, um, a lot of isolated parties moving backwards uh, and forwards. And units were unexpectedly running into prone German advance parties. An example of this involves this gentleman here, Major John George Brew. He was the commanding officer of the 9th Royal Irish Fusiliers, and he had been the commanding officer for about two hours uh, because the Lieutenant Colonel Philip Kelly, uh, <coughs> a Mayo man, um, commanding officer, had been wounded. Um, so, in the evening of the, the 26th, Major Brew and Lieutenant Colonel Michael Fernell who was commanding officer of the 1st Royal Irish Fusiliers, they had, were heading to brief uh, the brigade commander, the 108th Brigade, who was in Gurney here. And they were in the car of General Nugent's staff officer, Colonel Place. They ran into the German cavalry patrol um, and were captured. So they marched to the rear. The other Germans coming forward mistook them for people going to attack them and would fire on them. And they fatally wounded Major Brew. Uh, Major Brew was originally from Gateshead and was a sea captain. Uh, he married into the family of James Clough, Cornwallers. You see, still see the lorries in the road today, James Clough. And he lived in Carrick Blacker Road, Portadown. He was a prominent figure in Portadown UVF. He, was a, uh, he actually enlisted um, as a, uh, a private and was commissioned fairly quickly. 27th of March. Uh, the last day the division fought was a cohesive unit uh, in the area of uh, Gurbigny, here, Ursh and Arvillers, but they're scattered widely across this, in, this area. <laughs> the order was given from Corps Headquarters for the division to be relieved by the French 56th Division. However, it was easier said than done, so they were, they were scattered over a wide area. The last offensive patrol uh, of the division in the, in the offensive was carried out by the 1st Battalion Royal Irish Rifles early in the morning of the 28th of March. Thereafter, all units consolidated on the outskirts of Amiens to transport the rear of Amiens down past Montpellier, down this way. This um, 
in red shows the uh, route of retreat of the 1st Royal Irish Rifles. In just over a week, the division had retreated 105 miles, a massive amount of, of ground when you consider um, that the defences were deemed a success if the, if the, the vast few hours. But was it defeated? I would, I would suggest not. I would suggest the evidence states that it wasn't. In the words of Brigadier General Sir James Edmonds, the author of the History of the War, Military Operations, France and Belgium, the 5th Army grew smaller owing to casualties. It bent, but it never broke, and all its components remained in being. In fact, the 36th Ulster Division took over the front line near Plogsteert in Belgium to face the next phase of the German offensive on the 8th of April, so a week later. Look at casualties, and again, as I mentioned, uh, I was talking about casualties that were attached to the division uh, at the time. There were 966 killed, by my reckoning, uh, in, that, in the period they were involved. Of those, 103 were attached to the 61st Infantry Brigade, so that was the Duke Connors Light Infantry and 12th Liverpools, etc. Which leaves 100, 863. <coughs> of those four, when I researched every one, uh, 442 were born as I enlisted in the province of Ulster. <coughs> so one of the things I was thinking of when I was starting out to research this was, is it still an Ulster division uh, in 1918 compared to 1915? If you extrapolate that figure uh, throughout the rest of the, uh, the division, the fatalities, 51.2% of fatalities uh, in Ulster connection, struggling at that throughout the rest of the division, just possibly it was still an Ulster division, or could something rightly called the Ulster division in uh, 1918. Um, I reckon between four and a half, about 4,700, I think, were taken, taken prisoner. What are all those taken prisoner? Much is known about German prisoner war camps in World War II, but very little about those in the Great War. And through my research, I discovered vastly different experiences which had which merited a book on its own. Food was in short supply across Germany. The civilian population were basically existing on starvation diet and the last thing the Germans needed and hadn't counted for was a massive number of, of prisoners coming. Uh, organisations were set up to send food out to, to prisoners to supplement their, their diet, which meagre is, well, worse would be worse than meagre. So you can see parcels can be sent out here, and you know, what, what's in it? There's a lot of very good food there being sent out. It's up to 10 pounds in weight. But the very interesting thing is this is an exceptionally well-managed system to ensure that prisoners of war received the, the food. And probably because the Germans weren't able to defeat them, the Germans really did not interfere with this system. <coughs> and you can see that you sent back a receipt <coughs> when you got a food parcel. And this is our, our friend Captain Johnson from the 12th Rifles. You can see that he has received his first food parcel uh, on the 21st of June 1918 in the prisoner of war camp. And that's three months to the day of existing on basically thin gruel and, and coffee made from acorns. Um, so you've been pretty, pretty glad to get it. This annoyed me greatly. This is a headline from the BBC on the 2nd of July this year. <coughs> Uh, 16th Irish Division and 36th Ulster Division fell fighting around the village of Estony and the Crown. Well, no, they didn't. Uh, 16th Irish Division, I'm sure we here, suffered uh, horrendously, uh, equally as badly as the 36th Ulster Division. However, they were in a different core area and they were based at Ronsoy, which is 18 miles to the west. I sent, for the first time in my life, I sent an email to the BBC. <laughs> outlining why they were wrong in their coverage, and uh, I'm still waiting for a reply. <laughs> uh, I, I think there's, there's an attempt to rewrite history here of a political lens we haven't seen, we have Langham Mark, and they're trying to sneak in something else here that, that, that these divisions fought together. So, in the absence of any joy from the, uh, the BBC, I spoke to this lady here, who'd be familiar to you, Carol Walker, she was at the Song Heritage Centre. She assured me that the initiative came from villagers who, uh, the villagers of Essany, who had adopted a fallen Royal Irish Fusiliers soldier. Now that makes sense because first battalion Royal Irish Fusiliers were at uh, Corrie Redoubt, which is about 300 yards from the outskirts of Essany, so it's sort of reasonable to assume that. And the 
Well, that implicated me most is the text which says to the Irish soldiers who fell on the 21st of March, well, the 36th also division were Irish soldiers. So I'm, I'm fairly happy with that. The ironic thing is that Essendon's de Grand wasn't even held to the 36th also division either, it was held to the 14th late division. But we're not, we're not, <laughs> we're not dwell on the matter. <laughs> so thank you very much for, for listening, folks. This is my book which uh, details the experience of the 36th Ulster Division. Uh, it's going to be published by Helium uh, and Company and will be out in December of this year. So I need Christmas present. Um, contains much more detail and much, you know, many more stories than I've, I've been able to recount to you today. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, my name is Brendan O'Shea. Uh, I suppose I should just follow on from what Michael said there when he was concerned about the memorial uh, that he just put up there in the last slide. Um, we have to uh, contend with the fact that the uh, round tower uh, which we erected in Messines uh, is actually completely in the wrong place. At least that's only 300 metres away. Uh, and it is, it's always a source of embarrassment when you are talking to Australian and, uh, and New Zealanders and uh, you're, they're asking you curiously what this thing is doing in the middle of their uh, um, area of operations. And of course there are other answers for that. Uh, I always console myself by just saying better to have it there than nowhere, uh, and uh, I suppose it's a, it's a typically Irish thing, but it is, un it is unfortunate. Um, okay, I'm, I want to, to follow on, and I want to talk to you about the last days of the 16th Irish Division, and I, in a sense it's a little bit more profound, because we are talking about the demise of this unit, uh, the 36th Division did manage to, to live on and did manage to continue uh, to make a contribution to the end of the conflict. The 16th Irish Division did not for a whole range of, of, of reasons. So I, I would like to start then to tell this story uh, about what happened to the 16th Division. Um, and again, of course, we were focused on the 21st of March and I'm going to talk about that and then, and then go back a little bit and bring it forward again. But if you, do, if you look at nothing else on that map that's on the screen, you can see that there are more red than there are blue, uh, which is essentially the, 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 the essential point that we want to make here. Um, at 20 minutes to 5 on the morning of the 21st of March 1918, three German armies unleashed 6,473 heavy guns and 3,532 trench mortars on 50 miles of the Western Front, which was then held by the 3rd and 5th Armies. Essentially what you're looking at on the map. The impact was massively destructive and created wholesale confusion, but this was only the prelude to a massive follow-on ground offensive which had a number of objectives, but the main objectives were to break the Allied line, to drive a wedge uh, between the British and the French, and all going well, roll up all of these units here depicted on the map and push all of them back to the Channel ports and into the sea. That was the strategic objective at that particular time. Um, for those, most of you have never been subjected to uh, shelling of any description, I'm in the fortunate position where I've been shelled by the Israelis and I've been shelled by Hezbollah. Uh, and I know exactly what it feels like and that's only on a really low level. I have no idea what this felt like on that particular morning. It is beyond my comprehension uh, and I suspect it's probably beyond yours as well. Nevertheless, um, that's where the 16th Irish Division found themselves. Uh, Operation Mitre was designed as one of the most decisive moves of the war. And in the middle of the front, holding 7,000 metres of a salient frontage near the villages of Ronsai and Lempir, stood the 16th Irish Division with orders from their army commander, General Hubert Gough, already referred to, and their corps commander, Sir Walter Congreve, amounting to little more than a crude directive to hold their ground and prevent a breakthrough. Where they were, they were outnumbered six to one, and the division was about to die on the battlefields of France, and the political dream which had inspired the creation of the 16th Division in the first place, and all of the efforts that John Redmond made to encourage people from the south of Ireland in particular to join it, uh, was about to die amid the agony, the suffering and the chaos of a battle which could and should have been fought in a completely different manner. 
the carnage which happened on the 21st of March was not necessary. The problem was the people making decisions and doing the planning didn't know how to do it any differently. The 16th Division was raised and trained in Ireland during 1915. It was drawn from virtually every parish in the country, representing all religious denominations and none, north, south, east and west. And the horrors of this war quickly became apparent to them when they were deployed into the trenches in April 1916 at exactly the same time that the 1916 Rising was taking place in Dublin and they suffered hundreds of casualties following uh, attacks with phosgene and chlorine gas. Some months later they were moved south to support the latter phases of the Battle of the Somme and in September they distinguished themselves with victories at Guillemot and Ginchy. But they continued to suffer appalling losses. By the end of 1916 the division had taken 10,000 losses, uh, 10,000 casualties, 20% of whom were dead. I can't get my head around that either. One way or the other, that's a lot of bodies, and it's a lot of suffering, and it's a lot of agony. Um, in 1917, they had a notable victory at Messines Ridge, and we've spoken about the Round Tower, when they did fight side by side with the 36th Ulster Division, as they did at Langemark. And there's a map which clearly indicates that both divisions fought side by side uh, in a place called the near a place called the Friesenburg Ridge. And they both fell victim again to flawed planning, bad senior leadership, and complete unwillingness at army level to accept the fact that a strategy of trying to smash through five interlocking and fortified lines of German defence on a white front simply would not work. And that strategy belonged to nobody else except General Sir Hubert Goff and his superior, who was Field Marshal Haig. The Irish casualties continued to mount with another 4,000 sustained between the 16th and 18th of August alone, one third of whom were fatal. And talking about memorials, where that little spot is on the map, there is now a new memorial. Uh, it was unveiled last year and then we did a little bit more work with it this year to commemorate the fact that both the 36th and the 16th fought and died together on that battlefield uh, in August of 1917. Uh, that's what the uh, rock looks like. It has a brass plate on it which uh, commemorates the fact that both divisions fought side by side. And it has a blue plate on it now commemorating uh, Father Willie Doyle who was a chaplain to the 16th Division who uh, went missing. Uh, his body was never recovered and his, he's remembered on the wall in Tyne Cot. Um, for those of you who've been to Tyne Cot, uh, the next time you go there consider just position yourself at the Cross of Sacrifice, look back towards Ypres and look at the two massive bunkers that are in each corner of the graveyard and then consider the fact that what you're standing on was another bunker as well. That's the kind of fortification that the Germans had uh, in, in, in August of 1917 uh, right across the Passchendaele Ridge with five interlocking lines of defence. That is not what Goff and his friends decided to create uh, on, in, in uh, January, February or March of 1918, even though for some reason or other they thought or tried to make an equation between the two. So there's, uh, there's the memorial and it also has a signpost and the signpost says it's a long way to Tipperary and we've got Ulster, Munster, Connacht and Leinster depicted on it as well. And I would just like to mention at this point uh, Captain Jim Shine. Uh, Captain Jim Shine uh, died on the 16th of August 1917. Uh, he went to the same school that I went to in Dungarvan, County Waterford. His father was a doctor, he was a colonel uh, in the medical uh, corps and he spent the entire war in a field hospital uh, just in northern France. Jim Shine's first brother Dennis died at Mons in 1914. His second brother Huey died in Ypres in 1915. Jim Shine survived the, survived the Somme, was repatriated home and came back. He served with the Royal Dublin Fusiliers and he died on the Friesenburg Ridge with Willie Doyle and the rest of them in 1917. So picture that equation. One father, three sons, all involved, and that kind of tries to, for me it sums up the tragedy of, of, of the whole thing. So the last days of the 16 Irish Division started, they started there. They started on those fields, um, essentially down to, to bad leadership and a complete unwillingness to create a proper workable plan. 
In any case, coming back to the 21st of March, the division, uh, it, it did a number of things before it actually arrived here. It was in need of chronic rest, which it didn't get, and then it was given 7,000 metres of a, of a front line east of Quran to defend. Um, it was a shadow of its former self. Uh, it, all of the surviving Irish battalions uh, in the British Expeditionary Force had been grouped together now in the 16th Division. Uh, and because they were all seriously under strength, they were taking replacements from wherever they could get them. Um, the 16th Irish Division was losing its Irish identity by the time it arrived here on, uh, in, 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 uh, in January of, um, of 1918. Uh, and this is where they found themselves. And if I could just explain this, <coughs> um, what you're looking at there is the seventh core area of operation. So I'm just going to go away from my microphone for a minute. Uh, what we have here is a boundary, and we have a boundary here between the seventh core, uh, and we have a boundary here uh, be between the 19th core, which is which is here on the south. To the north, you have another boundary, but you have a boundary between the third and fifth armies. This is the worst possible scenario you can possibly have in terms of command and control. It's hard enough to control uh, uh, units and uh, get them to to operate in certain defined areas. But if you want to find a weak spot in your opposition, you will always look for the boundary. Because the boundary is where the coordination and the liaison and the communication is at its worst. And unfortunately, from the 16th Division's perspective, they found themselves right on a core boundary. And to their north, we had an inter-army boundary. And I spent a lot of time looking for evidence of coordination between this core and this one. I can't find it. I spent a lot of time looking for coordination between this army and the one to its north, and I can't find that either. And it does, to a certain extent, explain why the 16th Division, who found themselves here, uh, found themselves in such a crazy situation. To, to the south was the 66th Division, as part of this particular corps here, and it was the 66th Division and its failure that actually caused all of the problems for the 16th Division on the 22nd and 3rd. Of, uh, of March, but well, we, we, we'll come to that in a second. Um, the situation was compounded uh, when General Hickey became ill and was invalided home. He was replaced by this gentleman, General Hull, on the 10th of February. Uh, and then, as Michael has indicated to you already, all uh, divisions were downsized <coughs> from 12 battalions to 9 as part of the restructuring and part of Lloyd George's failure to release troops. Um, additional troops from the UK uh, to the Western Front. We don't have to go into that, it's just a fact that it happened. Um, in any event, my contention is that notwithstanding all of these issues which were happening, there was precious little leadership at the operational level where the 5th Army Commander's only plan consisted of holding the line in face of whatever attack was going to be mounted against him. The absence of any real conceptual plan was about to cost all divisions in the 5th Army the lives of thousands of their soldiers who should never have been put there in the first place. Now, it was Haig's prerogative to accept risk. You can divide up your troops whatever way you want to do it. And Haig weighted his defence in favour of the North because he believed, rightly so in my view, that the, the securing the, the Channel ports was the lifeline to his entire force. I don't have an issue with that. But if you accept risk, if, if you do that and accept risk somewhere else, then you must do something to mitigate the risk. And I can't find any evidence of anybody making a really uh, determined effort to mitigate the risk in the south, which is where Goff and his, um, and, and his, and, and his units found themselves. Um, instead, all I can find is what I call the strategic orders, the strategic orders came from the general staff, but they were implemented without question by the 5th Army and then all the way down to core level and divisional level. And essentially that was how the defence was constructed. A forward zone close to the front line, a battle zone just further back, and a rear zone which was back somewhere else, God knows where. Um, and essentially these three zones uh, would constitute the entire defence for all of the units, at least in the initial phases of it. So this is my graphic, and it's only a graphic to explain that. We have, this is a boundary between the 21st Division and the 16th. This is the boundary on the other side between the 16th and the 66th. And then where the two wheels are at the start, they're coordinating points. And across the front of that are 
observation posts, listening posts, just the forward positions, and then back into the two villages, which were not the kind of redoubts that Michael was talking about. These were just villages which weren't even fortified properly, into a battle zone, which is here, and then another village back here at St. Neil, and another town, King Corps, further back. So this was the kind of structure that was, that was designed. This was how the defence was to be done. But no pillboxes, no bunkers, nothing of the nature that the Germans created. And of course there wasn't time to do it. When the Germans arrived in 1914, they spent two and a half years building this stuff with reinforced concrete. Uh, but the point is that if you don't have those kind of fortifications in this zone or anywhere else here, then you must do something else. You just can't say, well, we just occupy it and it'll all be okay, because it won't be okay. And this is precisely uh, what happened. So here we are out on the front line. Uh, the division, uh, their fate was effectively sealed by their corps commander, who decided that the best thing that they could do was to deploy effectively all of their troops on the forward edge of their defensive area. So if I could just go back to this for a second, uh, let's go back here. So essentially what we have is we have five battalions of the six available who are all deployed in this area here. There's one back here in reserve. The rest of them are in core reserve, which means the divisional commander doesn't have command of them. They're under command to the core commander, okay? So it doesn't really matter where they are. They are actually back here, but they're in, in, in core reserve. Uh, so, this is, how they were, this is how it was configured, five battalions uh, up in front and, and one to the rear. And I just deployed it a little bit more, you can see now how they're deployed. From the other graphic I said that they were all deployed forward, so this is the front line, this is the forward edge of the battle zone, this is the battle zone itself, this is the rear area or the first phase of it, and then this is the back of it. So this is how they were set up on that particular day, with a problem on this flank here, because uh, in terms of coordination with their neighbouring core. Just because you draw a line on a map doesn't mean it's going to work. Drawing lines on the map is fine. We can do whatever we like. You, you must do something to coordinate that. You must do something to affect it. Equally, if the enemy on this side are attacking into this position, they're not required to respect our inter-core or inter-divisional boundaries. There's, there's no rule in the game that says they have to do that. In fact, it works exactly the other way around. If I know that that's an intercore boundary, that's where I'm going. Because that's going to be the weak spot. That's where the confusion can be created. Um, and there was nothing done here to, to, uh, to beef this up, uh, to give them support. This was just crazy. This was just absolute madness. And it, it just could not work. Um, equally, uh, at general staff and army level, nobody paid adequate attention to the intelligence reports that were coming from a civilian organization of train watchers called La, La Dame Blanche. These people were providing invaluable information, but wherever that information was going and being processed, it wasn't finding its way down in a, in a, in a properly processed way uh, to the people on the front line who needed it. Um, nevertheless, uh, Goff subsequently admitted that he knew the attack was coming on the 21st of March, he knew the opposition consisted of uh, Houthier, Marwitz and Von Billow, and he knew that Brookmuller was going to coordinate the fire plan, not alone for, for Houthier's army, but for the rest of them as well. But he decided instead that his time would be far best uh, occupied by riding his horse, horses at a gym cannon. And this is a direct quote from his book. This is on Sunday the 17th of March, um, the 20th Division had some sports and an officer's jumping competition for which I entered both my charges. In the afternoon I went to have a chat with the officers of this division and rode my two horses, one of whom was fort, out of a total of 120. Well, fair enough. <laughs> I did this not for the sake of a ride around the jumping course, which I enjoyed, but because I thought it was good to meet the 20th Division and see its members and all the rest of it. Okay? I remember that the Duke of Wellington attended the Duchess of Richmond's ball in Brussels <laughs> just before Waterloo, and that one of his principal reasons for doing so was, was the same. I felt I had good precedent for thus spending my Sunday afternoon. There's just one, you know, as, as Blackadder would say, there's just a tiny flaw in that. <laughs> the tiny flaw in the plan is that this guy was not Wellington, okay? Uh, or, or anywhere near. This is outrageous. Absolutely outrageous that the army commander would decide 
knowing what was coming at him. And he would decide to do this. I get it in terms of the morale and the esprit de corps and all that stuff. But there's a time and a place for that. Uh, a week before the battle or a couple of days before the battle is not, is, is not the time to do it. Uh, to make matters worse, it subsequently emerged uh, that three days be, um, um, previously... Uh, sorry, that was on the... Let me just get that right now. That was on the 17th, yes, three days previously on the 14th, during a visit by Gough to the headquarters of the 16th Division, Hull had actually sought permission to move three of his battalions away from the front line to give him some depth in his position, uh, and Gough uh, refused. Uh, his, uh, all he could offer was, uh, the Germans are not going to break my line. Uh, as a, and, in, and my interpretation of that, that he just was unwilling to either modify whatever was masquerading as a plan or entertain any idea of a mobile defence. Um, instead of adopting some kind of a mobile defence, uh, both the 3rd and the 5th Armies were, had locked their troops into 26 and 42 miles of rigid static positions which were not properly prepared, were too widely dispersed, could not mutually support each other, and were effectively guaranteed to crumble if the German artillery bombardment was successful, which it was. Meanwhile, out on the front line here at Epe, Ronsai and Lempire, the 16th Division awaited the German attack, which would consist of three assault divisions in the first wave, a further three in the second wave, and a battalion of stormtroops from the 3rd Jaeger Battalion interspersed amongst them. And on that fateful morning, the 21st of March, together with the 66th Division who were alongside them, the 16th Division would suffer the highest casualties of all other divisions in the line. Uh, 721 and 791 respectively for the two divisions who were there. Uh, it just incredible. Five hours of artillery bombardment smashed up the forward defences. Clouds of gas poured onto the battlefield. It was dead and dying everywhere. And when the German stormtroops eventually sprinted from the fog, uh, the forward zone was, was overrun in minutes. Uh, photograph from that time, not necessarily from that morning, but you get the general idea. The 5th Army's defensive system was a shambles, troops occupying forward positions were annihilated, the lucky ones were taken prisoner, and a chaotic, fragmented and uncoordinated withdrawal westwards began. It wasn't orderly, it was for the most part a rout, and I do accept that some divisions were luckier than others and they were able to uh, manage what they were doing. Now it gets even more interesting, having been roused from his slumber by the sound of the artillery bombardment at ten past five, the army commander decided that there wasn't much he could do for the moment so he went back to bed. <laughs> uh, he, after breakfast he made a few phone calls and figured out what was going on and the operational picture uh, kind of developed and by one o'clock it was clear to him that instead of holding the line he was now faced with trying to save his army from defeat and only then did he issue orders to his corps commanders to begin what he called a delaying action. That would be fine if anyone knew what that meant. But you can't just, you can't just throw that out and say, okay, uh, start up, could now conduct a delaying operation. Now where, where's the coordination for that? Well, where, where are your phase lines? How, many how much time are you going to spend on each phase line? Where's, where is the line that you ultimately are going to defend on? None of it. It didn't exist. And yet, as far as Goff was concerned then, and is subsequently uh, was concerned, because he wrote it in his book, uh, that he seemed to think that miraculously this could happen. And he said it was now obvious that the attack was so serious that I could not hope to fight it out successfully in the battle zone, but must carry out a delaying action which would aim at saving the army from complete annihilation, but which would enable it at the same time to maintain an in intact, though battered and tin line in the face of the German masses until such time as the British and French commands could send up sufficient troops to hold the ground. But there's a whole range of flaws in that. There was no plan. There were no reserves. This just wasn't going to work. And yet, at the end of when he wrote his book in 1938 or whenever the first edition of that came out, this was his, this, this was his explanation of, uh, of, of what he was doing on that day. Uh, clearly, nothing was happening. And, and again, out, out on the front line, if we go back now to the area where the 16th Division are, what was happening here? What, how, how did it all start to fall apart? Well, as I said, they were going to attack the two boundaries, because that's precisely what they did. They attacked the inter-core boundary here and the inter-army boundary on the north. So you have the, the red arrows represent the attacks that are coming in. 
Down here, the 66th Division falls apart. No criticism of the 66th, of course, because the divisional commander was Neil Malcolm. Neil Malcolm was Gough's chief of staff for a year and a half beforehand. He only ended up here about six weeks before the battle started. And yet the, 66, the, the, the crumbling effect of the 66th is what caused all the trouble for the 16th, a bit like the 36th and the 14th further south. And it, the graphic says it all. They broke through here, and then they turned right. So they drove up into the battle zone, and they drove into the rear zone, and now they're driving on right across, uh, right across the terrain, which is held by the 16th Division. On an intercore boundary, the weakest spot probably on the map, and all predictable. If you couldn't predict this, then you can have excuses, but this was predictable, and that's what makes it, in the first instance, very sad, and in the second, uh, unforgivable, in fact. Um, the people who got the brunt of this were the uh, 7th uh, Battalion of the Royal Irish Regiment, who were down here in this area here, on this edge of the, the forward edge of the battle zone, and they were the ones who took, uh, who got the worst part of it. Now, <coughs> I've been to France as well, and it, this is looking forward from the rear onto the forward area. So, as you're looking at the map, the, 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 the horizon line as you see it is the forward edge of the battle area. The, the forward air, the, 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 the observation posts and the, the listening posts and everything else are, are two clicks further out into the, into the blue, let's put it that way. So what we're looking at here is from the rear, you're, you're looking forward. So we put in our boundaries there, the, the, the boundary lines as we discussed, and that's roughly how they're deployed, okay? Okay, our reserves are off the map and they're under core control anyway, and we have six divisions and some stormtroopers coming in on top of us. So that's not going very well, and then down here, we have a breakthrough here on that, on, on that flank with the 66th Division, and then it comes in. And the people who bear the brunt of this are the 7th Royal Irish who are here, and the 2nd Royal Irish who are behind them. This is a graphic, okay? Not exactly where they were, but it's close enough for our purposes to understand what happened. Uh, in the initial bombardment, they immediately lost their two forward companies, then discovered that the enemy had broken through in force on the boundary, uh, so now they were under attack from machine guns on all sides, and once the fog cleared, from the air as well. Field ambulances couldn't get forward because of this, of this manoeuvre here, so everything to the rear was, was blocked. Um, so the wounded couldn't be evacuated, and by early morning all communication with the brigade on this particular side had ceased. There was wholesale confusion, and falling back into Ronsai village, they quickly discovered that they were now under attack from the rear as well, because they turned on them. Unable to mount a coordinated defence, small groups and individuals fought where they found themselves until finally at four o'clock, and unable to hold the enemy off any longer, Major Call, the commanding officer, ordered the 40 personnel still with him to surrender. The 7th Battalion of the Royal Irish had started that morning with a combat strength of 650. By seven o'clock that evening, a mere 41 of them had managed to struggle back to the village of Sonneville, which is actually back here in the rear area. All of the rest of them were either dead, wounded or captured. Uh, okay. Um, okay. We'll just move it along a little bit. Uh, right. Back in San Emil, which is the area to the rear, the, the village that's at our rear, uh, there was kind of at this stage some attempt made to, uh, to do some medical work for those who managed to, to, to escape to that particular position. And this is a quotation from Reverend William Scanlon, who was a chaplain to the 16th Division, and he made his way forward to the dressing station, which was housed in a dugout lit by candles. Uh, and he said, men lie groaning on stretchers along the side of the road, calling for water, but none is to be had. The dock is working hard, some limbs are being amputated. One man has both feet amputated, they say he would die of gangrene. I bring a few words of prayer with him, that all may be well. All this time stragglers are coming in, an officer with a revolver rounds them up. It's interesting. The Germans have broken through on the right, I can see them coming over in vast numbers on the crest of a hill a thousand yards away, enfilading our line from side. Our men fire from the road with rifles and a Lewis gun, a battery of the Royal Field Artillery are doing splendid execution and are driving them back over the hill. Well, they weren't driving them back over the hill, that was a complete illusion and probably wishful thinking on Scanlon's part. 
because right across the divisional front the pressure was intense. Uh, the German infantry were swarming all over the battle zone. There was no coordinated withdrawal plan. The only option for most units was to stand and fight. Um, there was, and there were in, in a number of small places, um, activity taking place where small units or small groups were actually holding together where the second battalion of the Munster Fusiliers were, uh, they were making uh, their last stand effectively. Uh, it was here that Lieutenant Harry Whelan and the remains of his company mounted the spirited defence that's just to the left of the centre of the front line. The war diary records that rifle and machine gun fire prevented the enemy from moving artillery up to the Malaysia Road and every attempt up to four o'clock that evening resulted in horses and drivers being shot down and this effective fire was maintained, was maintained in spite of repeated attacks from our left. So effective was this fire that the road became impassable until literally blocked with dead bodies of gun teams. About noon on the 22nd, having fired every round of ammunition, Wheel had buried his revolver and surrendered. Um, I can't even begin to get my head around what was going on. I mean, that's just chaos. Uh, and you're trying to bring order to chaos. Now, from my time in the military, I always used to say, that's what we do. We are in the business of bringing order to chaos. But this is just beyond you know, beyond the pale in many respects in terms of trying to, to, to retain control uh, in an orderly fashion. Unfortunately for Whelan, and like many who survived the fighting, he was badly wounded, he was taken prisoner of war, and he died three weeks later on the 11th of April as a prisoner of war uh, in Cassel. And unfortunately for, like many who survived the fighting, um, that, was, that was to be his fate. With the battle zone now crumbling, Hull ordered the deployment of the reserve, or at least asked for it, and was given the 6th Battalion of the Connacht Rangers and the 1st Munster Fusiliers. Uh, and in many ways, deploying your reserve in this scenario is folly, because the game is up. Um, what should have actually been happening there was they should have been reverting to some contingency plan to extricate people out of where they were in a coordinated way. But instead of doing that, now we're going to attempt to deploy a reserve. We deploy a reserve to do a counter-attack, to shore up what's going on already, uh, and in some way or other to, to solidify the line. Makes no sense. So why does Fielding do it? Well, soldiers do what they're told, essentially, for the most part, and at battalion level, battalion commanders do what they're told as well. And in the confusion that was going on, at some level or other, it probably made some kind of sense, uh, but it didn't work. Uh, they didn't even manage to coordinate with the 1st Battalion of the Munsters, they couldn't get that right. Um, the two tanks that were supposed to turn up never turned up, uh, and effectively the Connaughts were beaten back well beyond their start line, taking numerous casualties in the process. In the, in, in the process. Back at the dressing station, um, Reverend Scanlon decided to remain there overnight, ministering to the wounded, because we're now in the evening of the 21st. Uh, there appeared to be a lull in the fighting, but at 6 o'clock the next morning the German artillery started again. Again a ghastly line of wounded was coming in, all our artillery had been withdrawn. By 9 o'clock the Germans are entering the village, they poured through and around it, mounting a machine gun opposite the door of the dressing station. Four German soldiers enter, the dock explains what we are, and they go on and leave us alone for the present. We have no bread and no water, the wounded call for water continually, the place is full of wounded, some on stretchers, some sitting, one dies. William Scanlon and anyone who was alive with him was about to become uh, a prisoner of war. Okay. Uh, 48 hours after the attack began, the German 2nd and 18th Armies had captured almost 150 square miles of terrain that had previously been held by the 5th Army and punched a hole 20 miles deep into their defences. So that's where we were from the 16th Division's perspective. That's where the attack came from, and that's where it went. And every line on that map is a successive position to which the 5th Army were beaten back to. So that's where they started, and then every line on that map is a subsequent line until we get all the way back to the 4th of uh, April. Um, with casualties still mounting on the 26th, that was two days later, whatever was left of the 16th Division was transferred to the 19th Corps of the Third Army and participated in the Battle of Hamel, so they, that's the corps on their south they were transferred to. Um, but by the 4th of April they could no longer fight and were fortunate that the German offensive also ran out of steam. 
Um, by the time we get to the 4th of April, the 16th Irish Division had a mere 36 officers and uh, 1,200 uh, other ranks still standing, out of something that should have been about 12,000 people. This is, just, this is just incredible. 15 days of non-stop fighting had resulted in that many casualties, the highest number suffered by any division who participated in the battle. Um, and of course then the criticism started. These are criticism from some of the books. Uh, Shaw Sparrow's book, uh, forwarded by Goff, says Irish troops did not fight as well as they might have done. He's not talking about the 36th Division, he's talking about the 16th. Uh, and the other two said the division as a whole failed to act up to its reputation. Uh, Hull, to be fair to him, said, uh, I understand that rumours are being circulated at home that the infantry of this division have not fought well since the attack commenced. I desire most emphatically to contradict this. And everywhere from the general staff down through the corps, uh, the suggestion was uh, made clearly that because of the political situation in Ireland that somehow or other the 16th Irish Division had become disaffected and that and because of that that they didn't fight uh, as well as they could have done and it was complete nonsense. There is no evidence whatsoever to support it but, you know, um, somebody must be blamed I suppose. Roland Fielding who was the commanding officer of the 6th Connachts who led the counter attack on the evening of the 21st said the division fought bravely and hopelessly against a powerful enemy who outnumbered them six to one and no proper steps had been taken anywhere in the line to meet the threat which faced them or to mitigate the risk to their very existence. And that's the key bit, to mitigate the risk. Nobody mitigated the risk. I honestly believe it was beyond Goff's comprehension to even consider it. Um, in any case, uh, it was what it was. Uh, Hubert Goff's failure to learn anything from the manner in which the Germans conducted their defence of Passchendaele in 1917 effectively ensured that when the situation was reversed and he was required to defend, the manner in which he deployed his soldiers could only end in failure. Now, I want to be fair to Goff, so what I'll do is I'll take basic military principles, the principles of war, and this is not a retrofit. This is not me coming up with something out of a manual from the military college today and retrofitting it. All these, all this stuff, goes back to that time and well and well before it. So, if you consider any of those points and say, where did he get it right? Did he, did he maintain his aim? Did he even know what his aim was? Was there unity of effort? Most definitely not. What about maintaining morale? Okay, we might give him a mark for riding his horse into Jim Cannon. Ability to take offensive action in a defensive situation, no plan for it. Security, right and left and at core boundaries, no. Concentration of forces, no, because all he did with the 16th Division effectively was concentrate them in the one place they shouldn't have been. Economy of effort, flexibility and all the rest of it. He gets no marks, as far as I'm concerned. If that was the military college test, he fails. Uh, when it comes to the fundamentals of defence, did he use the terrain properly? <coughs> Absolutely not. The 36th had some hope, because when you look at the graphic and the way the redoubts were constructed and the lines that they had, it, 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 their task was, was every bit as, as difficult, but at least they had somewhere to go. There were defensive positions. Uh, I don't agree with the redoubt system, but at least there was a system for them to, to do it. There was nothing available in the area of operations that the 16th Division had. And you go down all the way, all around defence, defence, and death, death, the rest of it. It, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, summing it up, Gary Sheffield, uh, who's a big supporter of Hayes, but he said that whatever Goff's talents for mobile warfare, he was not the right man to command an army during the Battle of the Somme. He most certainly wasn't the right man to command an army during 1918 either. Uh, Nick Lloyd, who has written an excellent book on Passchendaele, said he took solace in blaming his own men and made it clear he wanted investigations into the causes of troops failing to hold ground they had gained. He wanted officers and men court-martialed. Now, we're not talking about the Irish here. This is from Passchendaele in 1917. So I'm now looking for indicators of a frame of mind or a methodology or a style of leadership, and I don't particularly like what I see. And I have said on several occasions uh, that his failure to learn anything from the German withdrawal to the Hindenburg Line in 1917 effectively ensured that when the situation was reversed, the manner in which the 5th Army was deployed could only result in failure. And that is unfortunately precisely what happened. And that's why the 5th Army, whether we like it or not, was beaten all the way from here 
to 38 miles all the way back almost as far as Amiens in a period of, uh, of, of 15 days. Yeah, we had this before, and there we go. Um, in terms of what happened to the 36, uh, the 16th division, the game was up. We've only got about, you know, they're operating at 10% of what they what they had to begin with. Um, it, um, it was reorganized. Um, it was moved to the 1st Army in April. Uh, it formed a composite brigade because that's all that was left. Then it went training um, um, American troops. It was totally reorganized in June. Uh, and it came back uh, to, to France um, at the end of July. But now it had five English battalions, two Scottish battalions, one Welsh battalion, and the only Irish battalion that was left was the 5th Royal Irish Fusiliers. Now, there were Irish battalions on the Western Front with other divisions. If there had been any strategic interest in retaining the uh, 16th Irish Division as a unit, those Irish units could have been plucked from the other divisions. That said, I suspect all of those units probably would not have wanted to find themselves in this new, strangely arranged 16th Irish Division for the simple reason that um, when, when units work with, their, with other subunits in, in a formation, uh, they develop uh, methodologies, they develop um, practices, they have common operational procedures. Um, the last thing any of those would want would be to be just plucked out of that particular environment where they were relatively comfortable and put into something which was an artificial construction in the first place. Um, the division survived, it went on and uh, it, in its new form, but certainly not as an Irish division, uh, and it took part in um, the final advance into Artois between the 2nd of October and the 9th, 11th of November, and it liberated the French coal fields at Lon and Dois, which are up to the north. I'm nearly there. Um, 50,000 officers and men served in the 16th Irish Division between the 1st of January 1916 and the 4th of April 1918. 27,500 of them became casualties and the fatality rate was 30%. This is the price that the 16th Irish Division paid to restore freedom to France and Belgium. Their endeavours were noble, their cause was just, and their sacrifice should never be forgotten. But we remember it by putting the round tower in the wrong place. <laughs> the 16th Irish Division deserved much better leadership from their army and corps commanders in March of 1918. The reality is that they didn't get it. So, it's therefore more appropriate to leave the final words on this subject, not with Gough or Congreve, but with the former Supreme Allied Commander, Field Marshal Ferdinand Foch, who wrote in the Irish Times in November of 1928 as follows. He said, some of the hardest fighting in the terrible days that followed the last offensive of the Germans fell to the Irishmen, and some of their splendid regiments had to endure ordeals that might justly have taxed to breaking point the capacity of the finest troops in the world. Never once did the Irish fail me, in those terrible days. In the critical days of the German offensive when it was necessary that lives should be sacrificed by the thousand to show, to slow down the rush of the enemy in order that our harassed forces should have time to reform, it was on the Irish that we relied repeatedly to make these desperate stands and we found them respond always. And in that you can have the 16th Irish Division and the 36th Ulster Division all included. Uh, and I suspect uh, that's what Foch was actually referring to at that time. So those were the last days of the 16th Irish Division, which was a very sad uh, demise of a proud Irish fighting unit that went to war for the most noblest of reasons. Uh, and on the Irish uh, monuments, which you find, uh, there's three of them, one, one in uh, Salonika, uh, one in Guillemot, and... Uh, and uh, one at uh, Vichetta, uh, the, the, the um, inscription on it is the cum glora de August and Oren the Heron for the glory of God and the honour of Ireland. Uh, and contrary to what a lot of people down south would have thought uh, in the years after the war concluded, uh, that's what those guys for the most part uh, went to war for and that's what they were doing uh, when they fought and died. And i leave you with this final thought. Um, I worked in, in, uh, with NATO in, in uh, Mons uh, in 2016 and 2017. On several occasions, I went to uh, official functions uh, wearing my uniform 
um, and I was just astounded at the number of Belgian and French civilians who would come up to me and shake my hand and thank me for the service uh, of, of Irish soldiers who had liberated their country. Um, you don't expect that, uh, you're certainly not looking for it, uh, and you are taken aback when it happens. Um, and it, it, if it, that for me is, is a consolation, if there is such a thing as a consolation for the casualty figure suffered by the 16th Irish Division and the 36th Division uh, in March of, uh, of 1918 and in the various battles that they fought before that time. Like it or lump it, north, south, east and west of this country, brothers in arms during a conflict um, and suffered equally. Thank you very much.